This is Bazaar Morning Call. Broadcasting live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal Studios in Mumbai. A very good morning. Welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. Uh, hope you had a good holy from us and all the entire team. Wishing you and your family a very happy holy. I'm Nigel D'Souza and joining me today, Reema as well as Surbi. Hi ladies, good morning. Hi, good morning, good good morning. Nigel, good morning Reema. And uh, yes, uh, welcome back after the long weekend. But the good news is we have another one coming up. So it's not a bad way to kickstart the week. Well, oh, absolutely. Three trading weeks sandwiched between a holy weekend and an Easter weekend. Oh, that's right. 72 hours, you went in for a break. You're coming back for 72, 72. hours. And, uh, in another, the next, 72 hours. another 72 hours. Another 72-hour break coming up. But let's get straight no, to the action. No, absolutely. Before that, uh, just sort of, you know, thoughts and prayers go out. The world is uh, not a very happy place, depending on which areas you're looking at. Geopolitics is an issue. And in Russia, what are the events that transpired over the weekend? Uh, so our prayers with, of course, all the people who were affected. But to get back to the market action and talk about sort of what's at hand. Remember, this is also the last trading week of uh, FY24. And it's been quite the year. Yes, towards the end, we've got this bit of a you know, roller coaster going on with the broader markets. But I think the takeaway from last week was that there seems to be signs of stability coming in the market, particularly the mid-cap and the small-cap universe. I'll get to that in just a bit. But, you know, we're reacting to two days of bunched-up queue. But not too much has shifted because the US market, what has it been doing if you're looking at Friday or Monday trade, largely consolidation, a bit of a cool off after the big, big rally. Though one must say that this little bit of a tick up in uh, the yields, the US 10 year, the US 2 year, as well as a small tick up in oil prices. Remember, Brent is about uh, 86, 87 right now. So that remains uh, a watch point in terms of the global queues. We don't have too many macro queues coming in. Once again, we'll talk about that's going to be on Friday and the reaction will come in next weekend, uh, next Monday, uh, the reaction to the US uh, PCE data. Just very quickly, so internals back here at home have been getting better. The Nifty managed to close above the 50 DMA on Friday. And as I said, mid caps are showing some signs of uh, stability. The VIX continues to decline. It's come down to about 12. So that trend was very much intact on Friday as well. I just want to put sort of, you know, uh, the fall in perspective along with the flows. Now, you can argue that the money that's coming in is because of block deals. The FPI money is what I'm talking about. But nonetheless, it is the same color and the color is green. And look at the positive number for March. We've got almost 38,000 crores uh, of inflow, more than 38,000 crores of inflow coming in from foreign investors after a very weak start to the calendar year. So that's good news. The fall, I mean, the correction or whatever you want to call it, the month of March, actually, the Nifty hasn't budged at all. The Nifty is up about half a percent. For the year, the Nifty is up about 30 percent. So you know, we're talking about the rounding up the fiscal, just 2 percent off the peak. Even on the mid-cap index, if you're looking at it, uh, the mid-cap index in March is down all of 2 percent. Uh, and it's up 60 percent for the one-year period. So that's not a bad stat to look at at all. Down about 5 percent from the peak. Small caps, and that's the, the question, whether the small cap carnage has settled or not. Because that's where the distance from the peak is still about 10%. The small cap index is still 10% of the highs. Though it's had a phenomenal year, about 68, 69% of gain. So not too many uh, people perhaps would complain. The market simply told us in the last couple of uh, you know, trading sessions that a uh, little bit of shakeouts can happen. Uh, I guess one more thing for me, guys, the watch point is going to be whether the IT selling is done or not. Whether Accenture was this one-day reaction, it's played out, yeah. or whether that repositioning will be the, the, the starting point of this week as we get into results season. Well, in two weeks, we'll have numbers which will provide, you know, further credence to whether there is going to be a recovery or pressure. But the Nifty IT index was down 2.3% in Friday's trade. But to quickly round up all the cues then for our markets this week, last week, the Nifty ended higher. And the key point about last week is that on a week-to-date basis, it ended up 0.3% and ended very close to 21,900. But the recovery from the Wednesday intraday low, which was 21,710, stands at close to about 700 points. So last week was an extremely volatile week for our markets. The first half, there was pressure. But in the second half, there was a fair amount of rebound. In fact, you spoke about small cap. The small cap index ended with a gain of 1.4% for last week. In terms of Wall Street action, Wall Street paused yesterday. But they had clocked in a strong rally in the prior week. So in the prior week, you had the S&P, the Nasdaq gaining close to about 2%. And yesterday, Wall Street saw a bit of a breather and most of the indices ended mildly down, 0.3-0.4% down. Crude prices have risen to $87 per barrel after Ukraine strikes, the Russian refineries, the US 10-year bond yield too has spiked. Last week on Friday, you know, after we got those FOMC minutes, it went down to levels of 42 
This morning, it's risen to levels of about 4.25, 4.26. The big events, you spoke about the PCE index. That's the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index out on Friday. But on Friday, you also have a, you know, a speech by Fed Chair Jerome Powell at the San Francisco Fed Conference. So those two events will be important, you know, tracked by the markets. But back home today, per se, uh, you know, Nigel, you've got the Nifty Financial Services expiry. Oh, well, that's right. You know, on Friday's trading session, it seems that the Nifty and the Nifty Bank was going to run away. But we met some kind of resistance at higher levels. You know, so let's uh, track the top points that we're looking at for today. The Nifty and the Nifty Bank, well, we've seen a good bounce, but those crucial resistance levels, well, that remains elusive. The broader markets, well, they could continue outperforming because volumes could be a little bit tepid. It could be a year-end phenomena as well that plays out. So I expect the broader markets to continue to do quite well. And the financial Nifty services, well, that plays out the weekly expiry as well. So those are the top points that I'm looking at in today's trade. Well, let's tell you about the volumes. For the past week, the volumes are much lower than what we saw in the previous week. So volumes that we saw were closer around 20% lower in comparison to the previous week. And obviously, with a truncated week, you expect the cash market volumes to remain tepid even in this week. What do the FIs do? Well, as I've been mentioning all of last week, the FIs were getting aggressively net short. And from those net short levels of closer to 95,000 contracts, that's come down to around 72,000 contracts. That's the power of short covering, right? When you're not seeing any big flows coming in from the FIs, well, when they trap themselves on the short side, that's actually a blessing in disguise because it keeps, keeps the markets uh, you know, at higher levels. Options data. Well, you have call writing that's coming in back. And just when you saw, you know, you thought that the Nifty is going to run away in Friday's trading session, it U-turned from around the 22,200-odd mark. And the call writers, they believe that they've got this covered. They don't expect the Nifty to get past the 22,300-odd mark. However, on the downside, the only strike, you know, that's going to expire on Thursday that has one crore shares in terms of open interest is the 22,000 put. You know, and that has opened us of around a crore shares. The premium out there has come down to around 60. We're seeing a lot of writing at those levels. So let's get straight to the levels then that we're tracking on on the Nifty itself. It almost U-turned from around the 22,200 odd mark. That ties in with the 20 DMA as well. So that becomes a couple of reference points that you're looking at. And on the downside, the 21,900 mark should be rather important because that's the first level. If that breaks, then you look at the 21,710. The Nifty Bank as well, for that one as well, the 47,000 mark has remained elusive and for the Nifty. So I'll be watching both these two levels. If the bulls can get the markets above these levels, then in fact, maybe we'll see a bit of a bounce that takes place. Stock that I'm tracking for the day, JSPL. You know, the stock should be in focus. First, fundamentally, coking coal prices are down by close to 10% in the last uh, week or so. So that's good news. Coking coal cost cooling off, that's an input cost, so that's uh, good. And the promoter entity has been in focus. Mr. Na Naveen Jindal, he's been uh, appointed as the president of the Indian Steel Association. So that's important. The second factor is the political twist, given that it's a big political year. And there's been some political you know, uncertainty on this company. Mr. Jindal has joined the BJP, and now he'll contest the Lok Sabha on a seat that he had won a couple of terms ago. So that's going to be important, at Kuru Shetra. So we'll keep an eye out on that as well. And the reason I say this is important is because the market is always uncertain on terms in terms of what the promoter is going to do less. And that's why, in fact, you know, you have it that it trades at a bit of a discount. So the stock that I'll be tracking today is JSPL. Let's see if we can get past those crucial resistance zones as well. Okay, thank you very much for that. Well put. Let's get to the equity market action then. And important opinion, Mahesh Nandurkar says, the Jeffries Asia Forum 2024 in Hong Kong saw participation from 18 Indian companies with approximately $300 billion in market capitalization. He says FBI level of excitement on India is high, though valuation is an issue. He says cyclicals continue to see strong demand conditions across industrial and property sectors, adds that financials are seeing moderation in margin and growth in the near term, but they're confident about the asset quality. Mahesh adds consumer commentary is mixed and they say stay overweight on cyclicals like property, industrials, power, banks and telecoms. All right, that's the Jeffrey's call on the equity side. Let's get you some money market views as well. Abhishek Goenka of India FX and Asset Management says the rupee weakened last week but has recovered from lows as the yuan turned around on Monday. He does not see a runaway depreciation in the rupee. And with forex reserves now at an all-time high, he believes the RBI will continue to wield significant control over the USD INR pair to keep volatility in check. He expects the pair to trade in a range of 82.60 to 83.60 over the medium term. On the bonds, Vishal Goenka of IndiaBonds.com says, sharp moves on Friday in the bond market was caused by a weakening INR in line with the other Asian currencies. 
He expects bond yields to be range-bound given it's a short three-day trading week with no significant economic data and financial year-end. Uh, Add supply-demand dynamics will change from next week as borrowing resumes. He expects the 10-year benchmark bond deal to trade in a range of 7.07 to 7.12% today. Well, we've got a lot of stock-specific action to track for you. We'll get to that in just a bit in our special Top 10 segment. For the time being, we look at uh, the list that we're tracking for you. Life insurers, Lupin, Adani Ports, HAL, RBNL, Wellspun Corp, and Vedanta. All of them are the ones that will be reacting to positive news. On the flip side, you have Mankind, JM Financial and IIFL Finance that will be reacting to negative news flow. Okay, so lots of stock talk coming up, but first let's start with the big picture. How is the flow situation looking like? Cameron Brand, Director of Research at EPFR Global, is now joining in to give us some perspective. Cameron, hi, great to have you on the show. So we are rounding up the end of the financial year here in India, and it's gotten a little wobbly in the last couple of days. Uh, coupled with some commentary that we're picking up that perhaps uh, flows are now seeking uh, a home in China as well. So just give us your perspective on what overall equity flows into Asia have been looking like and, and where India stacks up. So you're certainly right that uh, flows towards emerging Asia have uh, lost considerable momentum over about the past 10 days. Uh, what we're not seeing is them go to in, uh, to China in any meaningful way. So, uh, yes, uh, less money chasing direct exposure to India. No, no immediate sign that it's rotating towards China, which obviously has its own issues. Um, in general, the focus in the past uh, week or so has been uh, Japan after the Bank of Japan uh made its well telegraphed decision to end the negative interest rates and uh, the yield control program on the 10-year bond. Um, so there's definitely sort of a, a little bit of a watch and wait quality to you know the commentary and the flows that we've been seeing in the past week. Okay. Uh, so Cameron, uh, just come in on this point about Japan, right? Uh, Japan has raised interest rates for the first time in 17 years. No longer it's a negative interest rate regime. Considering that yen is used as a medium for carry trade, how, in your opinion, how do you think this impacts flows going ahead? Well, it's, the potential is certainly there for it to be quite disruptive. Um, Japanese investors remain pretty interested in overseas exposure and as you just mentioned the yen has been a uh, staple of the carry trade uh that said um i think that uh, interest rates will have to move a little higher and a little more consistently for things to really unwind so at the moment most of that i think remains in the realm of theory rather than uh, tangible impact on foreign markets Hi, Cameron. Good morning and good to see you in. Nigel on this side, you know, the last time that we chatted, you were talking about India getting $600 million odd, uh, of inflows and you didn't see any sign of it cooling off. You know, what have you noticed last then? Uh, is there some cool off in terms of the dedicated flows to India or no sign at all? Yes, the finally have seen, uh, and really it was only, only last week when... Uh, Flow sort of dropped into the 100 million range, which uh, is still a pretty healthy uh, weekly inflow by historical standards, but compared to what dedicated India funds have been getting used to, uh, it's actually the lowest in, in weekly inflow in several months. Um, you know, that said, it wasn't uh, it, just India funds that saw uh, a much more cautious uh, approach last week. Um, you, there have been obviously major central bank meetings to pay attention to, um, and uh, we, you know we're in that uh, end of quarter gap when the one earning season is over and another is about to begin. So you know the overall picture is fairly cautious. Uh, flows at a fairly low ebb. Um, but India is still, though, um, the height of the poppy is a little shorter than it has been, is still the, the tall poppy in the field. The tall poppy in the field. Okay, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. Uh, just to sort of, uh, you know, uh, dwell on that point a little more, 
the slight dip that you're talking about, is that only seen in India dedicated funds or is it in other funds where uh, India is part of the basket? Can you give us some more color on this uh, yeah. you know, minor dip? So, yeah. So that, uh, that was really just in India dedicated funds. Um, mm -hmm. Flows to the diversified global emerging markets funds have picked up a little bit in recent weeks, but are still you know, fairly muted. Uh, within those gem funds, India's allocation continues to climb. Uh, it's at a record high at the moment. Um, but unfortunately, since those funds aren't, is, aren't getting much uh, fresh money to allocate, it doesn't do India as much good as, as it might in more broadly enthusiastic uh, periods for emerging markets. All right. Uh, Cameron, what about other asset classes? Gold is twinkling. As are we seeing... Uh... Uh, you know, increased uh, flows out there. I mean, what is your sense that you're seeing? How does it compare with the average? Um, so the, compared with the average, it's been very poor. Gold, gold funds have not been popular. Um, mm -hmm. And the obvious alternative has, has, has been the cryptocurrency funds. They've been seeing really significant inflows. Now, again, just this past week, uh, past 10 days or so, that has changed. And we've seen a bit of a crossover. Um, so it could be that uh, gold funds will start to do as well as the price of gold suggests. Okay. So, uh, you know, Cameron, to sum things up, uh, or would you say it's too early to call if there's any sort of a major trend reversal? Because you're saying this is just, uh, this dip towards India is about a week old. And also to go back to that point on Japan, I mean, any estimations or any, any sort of a rough framework that you're working with, how that major macroeconomic event could start uh, influencing the way money's flowing around Asia specifically? The, the first thing that uh, people will uh, pay attention to, there's a 40-year a uh, Japanese government bond auction this week. Uh, I think that'll get a fair bit of attention. Um, but... Uh, you know, I'm anticipating, you know, bar something out of out of left field, a, you know, a, a slightly quieter couple of weeks. Uh, you know, e equity indexes have soared to fresh record highs and sort of moved out of many people's comfort zones. Um, debt issuance is at very high levels, certainly in uh, Europe and the US, and there's a, an undercurrent of unease about the market's ability to absorb that. Um, and they, you know, there's the Japan card. So I, I think, uh, I think uh, it's going to be softly, softly uh, for a couple of weeks. Cameroon, we'll leave the discussion here for now. Thank you very much uh, for joining in. Uh, have a good night. Uh, we'll slip into a break on that note. On the other side, our list of top stocks is lined up next. Welcome back. The Gift Nifty is suggesting a slightly lower start. The queues from Asia also mix. The Gift Nifty should come up for you on your screen. In Friday's trade, though the markets did end higher and closed closer to the 21,900 mark, uh, we did end, sorry, 21,000, 22,100 mark. We did end off the day's high, which was 22,180. And this morning, the Gift Nifty is down close to about 57 points. Our research team is standing by with CNBC TV 18's list of top stocks for the day. And first up, let's go across to Yash for the latest on life insurers. Yash. Well, Reema, I'm going with green when it comes to the life insurance companies and uh, a slightly darker shade of green for especially two companies, that is HDFC Life and Max Financial Services. Uh, the reason is uh, the regulator's decision to sort of withdraw its earlier proposal on surrender value. Remember, in December 2023, the regulator had proposed to increase the surrender value. The increase in surrender value 
was uh, twice as much uh, as what exists today. Surrender value is what the life insurance companies have to pay to their policyholders in case of voluntary early surrenders of policies. Now, this was expected to add significant pressure on these life insurance companies' margins. But now what has happened is the regulators withdrawn that proposal. A new modified proposal has come in. And what the regulators done and what we've been reporting is that they've implemented a graded surrender value as the policy matures. Now, the new rates for surrender values are same as what exists today which means there won't be any additional pressure when it comes to the margins for these life insurance companies brokerages that are estimated about 400 basis points impact now that gets out of the way and a big overhang with that also goes out of the way okay all right uh, well yes yeah, i've been on top of that so good on you and as you said the what was worse feared hasn't really come about so uh, good news for these insurers well done well, let's uh, go across to Ekta. Ekta is tracking a couple of these farmer names. Uh, Mani, Ekta, take it away. Well, yes, I'm going to start with Mankind, where sources have indicated to CNBC TV18 that Beige Limited, which is basically Chris Cap, is going to be selling up to 2.9% via block deal. They currently hold around 2.99% stake in Mankind Pharma, and with this stake, sale, they're probably going to be exiting entirely. The offer size at the lower range is around 2,460 odd crores. The offer price is in the range of 2,100 rupees to around 2,214 odd rupees. Uh, so maybe the stock could initially be in the red on account of pressure, but expect the stock to probably recover on account of the overhang being removed. Now, Lupin would be in focus because the company plans to transfer its trade generics business in India to a wholly owned subsidiary, Lupin Life Sciences. So Lupin is going to be receiving around 100 to 120 crores on account of this. FI23 revenue for the Indian generics business was around 277.7 crores, which is 2.5% of total sales on a standalone basis. Reason for doing this, achieve agility, better focus, growth of the trade generics business. And the trade generics business company said is poised for higher growth. Specific focus is required to achieve this. So maybe we can expect Lupin to probably be in the green because they will be receiving around 100 to 120 crores on account of this. Okay, Ekta got that. Thank you very much for the details over there. Let's uh, go across to Hormaz now for news on Adani Ports. And it's uh, fairly important because Adani Ports has snapped up another asset. And this time it's a port that was originally belonging to the Shapurji Palunji group, right, uh, Hormaz? So uh, take it away, numbers, details. Morning, Surabhi. And as you said, the SP Group port, the Gopalpur ports, is majorly owned by the SP Group. Now, they've acquired a 95% stake as Adani Ports for a cash consideration of around 1350 crores, an enterprise value of 3080 crores, subject to final adjustments. And this transaction is likely to be completed by the first quarter of FY25. Now, if you break up this 95%, 56% of that was owned by the SP Port Maintenance, which was an SP Group unit. And the other 39% was owned by Orissa Steve Doors. Now, in FY25, 23 Gopalpur ports handled around 7.4 million metric tons of cargo with and has an overall capacity of 20 million metric tons and as of FY24 it is expected to handle around 11.3 million metric tons of cargo and earn around uh, 520 crores in operating revenue now, the management has also said that they have already identified opportunities for achieving higher operational efficiency for the Gopalpur port and which will result in infrastructure debottlenecking as well now if you remember Adani ports uh, reported cargo volumes of around 33% growth in the month of February and they are on queue to surpass their FY24 guidance as well. Now, this Gopalpur port could add around another 25 MTPA of capacity is what the analysis is suggesting. So, another port snapped up by Adani Ports, as you highlighted. Expect the stock to open in the green. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Hormoz. Well, I'm looking at Vedanta because reports indicate that iron ore mining is set to restart in Goa after nearly six uh, years. Just to give our viewers a quick background, the mining had halted in March 2018 due to the Supreme Court hearing, but they said that the second time the renewal should not happen for mining leases. So that's why there's been no mining that's been taking place out there. For Vedanta, well, they've got the consent now to go ahead and operate from the, from the Goa State Pollution Board. So that's a step in the right direction, and that's why, in fact, they will restart. The total approval they've got is for around 3 million tons per year of, I don't know, from the Bicholim block. So We'll have to see how soon can they restart. But just to give our viewers a quick background, maybe 10 years or so ago, they used to mine nearly around 15 million tons in Goa. So sentiment positive for them. The, the ore that comes out of Goa is not the highest quality ore. So it doesn't move the needle for all the buyers of iron ore here in India. That's the steel producers. All this iron ore that's produced in Goa is normally exported. But positive news flow and a sentiment positive coming in for Vedanta. So keep an eye on that stock. Okay, thank you very much for that. And for some more stocks which are in the news, Vamakshi joins in. Vamakshi. 
Well, absolutely. Keep an eye out on JM Financial and IFL Finance. Now, both of these counters will be in focus because the RBI is expected to conduct special audits of both of these firms. RBI has, in fact, called for two separate tenders for the same and the last day of uh, submission of these bids is April 8th, while the selected firms will be awarded work on April 12th. Now, just to give you a brief background, IFL Finance was barred from extending loans since, uh, especially gold loans since March 4th, while JM Financial is facing a ban on financing shares or debentures since March 5th. Now, while imposing these restrictions on both these entities, the RBI had earlier said that these restrictions will be reviewed upon completion of a special audit as well as after rectification of the deficiencies that they had found. So, on the back of that, we actually saw that IFL Finance was down almost 46% from March 4th, while JM Financial is down nearly 24% uh, since March 5th. And on the back of uh, this news flow, we expect to see both of these counters under pressure today as well. Mm, I guess that's uh, because of the special audit from Akshay. Thanks very much. So the overhang doesn't seem to be over till the results of this uh, audit are out in the public. Uh, Vivek has some more stocks on his radar. Good morning, Vivek. Which ones are these? Well, good morning. You know, few stocks to keep on your radar on the back of news flow that came in, uh, you know, over the weekend. So first up is HAL. The company has received an order for supply of Hindustan 228 aircraft. Now, this is from the Guyanese Defence Force. The total contract value is 194 crore. The second stock to keep on the radar is RVNL. The company has signed an MOU with Airports Authority of India. This is for the construction of a subway in Calcutta. The estimated cost of the project is close to 200. 30 crore. Keep an eye out for Wellspun Corp. The company made a couple of updates to the exchanges. On March 22nd, the company said there was, there was a mutual agreement with Aramco to cancel a 200 and 339 crore contract with Epic, which is one of the subsidiaries of the company. This again was for supply of steel tubes. But on March 25th, you know, it appears as though this particular order is upsized. So the company has signed a contract sign off with Saline Water Conversion Corporation. The total contract value is 512 crore. And again, this is for manufacturing and supply of steel pipes. So keep an eye out for Wellspun Corp. You know, all of these stocks are expected to open in the positive. Okay, thank you very much for that. Here's a quick recap of the top stocks that we're watching. Stocks with positive news flow are Life Insurers, Lupin, Adani Ports, HAL, that's Hindustan Aeronautics, RVNL on the order win, Wells Fund Corp and Vedanta. Stocks with negative news flow are Mankind Pharma on the back of that expected block deal, JM Financial and IFL Finance. You know, there's one more stock that we'll be watching today is Bharti, Hexa Bharti Airtel mm -hmm. because Bharti Hexacom has announced the dates for its IPO. Okay. It will be the first IPO of uh, 2025. 2nd April is when they're, okay. you know, uh, looking to open the IPO. And the total market capitalization of Bharti Hexacom will be 28,500 crore. And Bharti has a 70% hold, is, you know, stake, stake in, in that. that. So it's approximately 20,000 crore of value. Uh, mm -hmm. that you know Bharti Airtel holds in this company Bharti Hexacom so that's going to be another stock that we will be but, watching but they, they don't get any money as you explained no. yeah, right? because they're not the ones yeah selling. so they're not they're okay. not selling any stake this is going to be a pure offer for sale the sale will be done by a government entity which is housed under the DOT called Telecommunication Consultants India they are the only public shareholder in Bharti Hexacom and they will be offloading part of their stake it's value, you know, unlocking for Absolutely. Bharti Airtel in a way. So that's going to be another stock that we will be tracking. But let's now go across to Hormus for some brokerage notes to focus on for the day. Hormus. Well, starting off with Morgan Stanley on oil marketing companies and these sec these stocks have been the subject of a lot of debate and discussion over the last month or so. And Morgan Stanley believes that the integrated margin tracking is above the mid-cycle as oil prices continue to tighten along with the fuel. And their view of a consensus upgrade cycle remains fully intact in FY25. That is a bigger takeaway and that is because the global refining margins remain strong and among the stocks they prefer Indian Oil and BPCL. Now HSBC has come out with a note on the Indian auto sector where they believe that exports have been weak for both Bajaj and TVS and they are not seeing any sharp recovery in two-wheeler exports. They call that unlikely and the full benefit is likely to reflect only in 2025 and in 2026 as we go forward. Among the two names, they have a buy recommendation on Bajaj Auto with a price target of 9400 
they're calling it a defensive company as compared to peers given that it has a stronger export portfolio and a stronger balance sheet now tvs it has a hold rating at price target of 2300 they say that the risk reward here appears balanced and there is a lack of near term catalyst for tvs motors then lastly nomura which has come out with a note on uno minda uh, they entered into a technical licensing agreement recently then they have a price target of 820 rupees with a buy recommendation and they believe that this uh, agreement expands the company's capability in the ev car segment and that they have a strong track record of scaling up in the newer segments and they are expecting a healthy ramp up as production begins over the next one year due to the established relationship that Unominda already has with the existing OEMs. And for Unominda, the larger medium term opportunity will be its ability to add more EV car components and expand its kit value going forward. So a positive note there on Unominda. Back to you. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot uh, for that, Hormuz. Well, let's hop across to Manisha. She is going to tell us what's going on in the commodity and currency space. Uh, hi, Manisha. Good morning. Morning, Nigel. Thank you for that. Well, I'll start with the crude oil prices where we have seen strength come back, and this is because of the tight global supplies. The latest trigger coming in from Russia, which is set to cut output as Ukraine targets refineries, and that has led to Russian refineries shut down 10% of its capacity. Also, Gaza ceasefire, while the conversation has been on for some time now, but on-ground implementation hasn't happened, so that premium continues to stay in crude prices also. For the precious metal prices, it is back in the positive. Uh, you have various Fed speeches happening in this week. The U.S. inflation data comes in as well. So ahead of that, there is some stability coming in there. The only area that has gone down in profit-taking has been the industrial metal. Most of the base metals have started the day on a weaker note. There is strength in U.S. dollar. And the market still concerned about China property sector and increasing inventories. And that's led to some profit-taking. Thank you very much for that. We'll slip into a very short break. On the other side, we'll be joined by our market expert, Prakash Devan, for some fundamental stock analysis. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Hope you're having a good morning. Prakash Sivan joins us to help us out with some fundamental analysis on the stocks that we just discussed. Uh, hi, Prakash. Uh, good morning and hope you had a good holy. Well, I wanted to ask you about mankind. You know, on Friday's trading session towards the end, you saw a bit of a spike up. And now we understand that the P is looking to sell closer on 2.9% stake. Now, importantly, what this does is it increases the free float, which will result in inflows and a high possibility that the stock gets included in the MSCI. You know, I'm uh, reading an alternate note coming out of uh, Nuvama as well, and they are fairly positive on the stock. What's your view, Prakash? So the stock is not very, very cheap, but it appears this technical factor will play out in their favor. Good morning, Nigel. Thank you. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think it's it's a wonderful opportunity to buy into a stock that's been out of reach, uh, a because of value. Uh, ever since it got listed, it's it's just been flying away. Uh, so from its peak, of course, it's available at uh, some sort of a you know cool off. The second thing is that the float has always been a worrisome point, in spite of a very strong uh, holding by institution. There's not much institutions can do to add to this this thing. But remember, from a business perspective, it's uh, though it's you know a latecomer in the listed space. Uh, as a company, it's been doing wonderful work within the Indian market. It's it's one of the largest players in India. Um, doesn't get talked about much because, as I said, it has a very short history in the listed space. But going forward, the kind of scale-up that they have on the cars, the way they manage the capital allocation so efficiently, uh, it will always fetch a premium. You know, so if, if pharma is reviving, there's more allocation that's being uh, very clearly indicated by fund. And look at, look at some of the turnarounds in the pharma space, especially the largest ones, uh, Nigel. You have Lupin from 750, 800 to 1600. Sun Pharma from just close to 1,000 to about 1,600. So you, you have a lot of salience that's been captured by portfolio managers uh, by allocating money into this thing. I think this this will be an opportunity for people if there's that discount that is significant uh, or, or to its full capacity of 5%, I think it will be definitely worthy of getting into uh, from a medium to long-term perspective. I'm, I'm quite positive on the name, and I think this block will get absorbed by uh, institutional financial investors and not necessarily some 
uh, strategic investor looking at FDI kind of uh, investments here. Beige, by the way, is an affiliate of uh, the private equity firm Chris Capital, and they're the ones which are looking to exit Mankind Pharma. Uh, Prakash, morning. What about Uno Minda? Uh, the news is they've entered into a technical agreement with Star Charge Energy for EV charging infrastructure. So basically, they will be making wall mounted chargers for home charging for residential use, and these will be sold along with the electric vehicles to the customers by the OEMs. Now, Uno Minda already has a fairly strong presence in two-wheelers OEMs uh, on the EV side. And now they're expanding their capabilities to include, you know, EV charging for passenger vehicles also. Do you see this as a big positive for, you know, Uno Minda, which can re-rate the stock? Good morning, Rima. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this is coming right at the back of, uh, you know, the uh, electric mobility policy changes that the government announced. And ever since that has happened, look at look at what's happening to the ancillaries. There's not much of a, a you know, a, a, what do you call it, disruption that's happening on the OEM side. And there were worries that some of these largest OEMs which have gone the EV path, like Tata Motors and Mahindra might face resistance, but that's not likely to happen. What's likely to happen is that the entire ecosystem will start uh, getting into place. and. Some of these leaders, whether it's Sona BLW on the component side, uh, Unominda now on the charging infrastructure side, they will uh, start enhancing capacity. And Star Charge is a very established technology. Uh, I've seen it at work. It's compact, it's efficient, it's user friendly. There's no reason why, with those kind of things, the EV sales don't move beyond this, you know, seven eight percent that they're stagnating at to some at least some respectable numbers in the mid teens or late teens. So my my sense is that. EVs are here to stay for at least the next three, four, five years. And, and without infrastructure, without the charging infrastructure, this won't happen. And there are very few companies in India who have indigenous technology to kind of scale up uh, on a mass utility base. So that's that's exactly why these JVs become more important. Of course, we'll have to you know, go through the, uh, the, the uh, what do you call the, uh, you know, the wordings of the arrangement, what kind of, you know, technology transfer is involved, what kind of stakes these companies would uh, eventually land up with after uh, consummating this relationship. But it's a great step. So, yes, you know, you know, Minda getting re-rated, huge potential, uh, huge possibilities uh, after uh, at the back of this particular development. So this Star Charge, I was just reading, they provide uh, char EV charging solutions to multiple OEMs like Mercedes-Benz, Porsche's yeah. one, Volkswagen, and they're already the leader in the Chinese market. Uh, and now Uno Minda has gotten into the tie-up with Star Charge, where they're targeting passenger vehicles, EV charging for home consumption, residential use. Okay, so charged up. I know that's the EV space for us. Uh, Prakash, hi, good morning. Hope you had a good uh, long weekend and a good festival. Uh, just want to talk about uh, life insurance because as we were getting into this holy weekend, we finally got that news, right? That uh, the surrender value norms are not going to bite as hard as what was earlier feared. Any interest in these stocks? And in the last one month, I mean, they haven't run up uh, that much either. Uh, do you like any? Good morning, Shabhi. Uh uh, yes, I mean, there is there is a very clear, uh, what do you call, uh, overhang that's gone out. This whole thing of, uh, you know, the surrender value uh, norms getting kind of restored by uh, the IDA is, is definitely positive. It kind of takes away the entire, uh, you know, question of what's what's likely to be the terminal value for most of the embedded or the embedded value for most of the books that uh, these insurers sit on. Now, this will help people start looking at valuations uh, a new in in the sense that you know that this is one factor that's out of the way. So it is very positive in the long term, of course. Uh, but if you ask me why the stocks haven't moved up in the last month or so, it's it's primarily because the focus has been on so many other things. These stocks usually uh, always take a back seat uh, when the market is in a very volatile or a very momentum driven kind of a mood. You know, so th there's there's nothing that kind of changes for them on a quarter on quarter basis. But of course, March and will probably reflect some very positive numbers. And I keep on saying, if you have to allocate money to this sector, because this is a sector that's not going anywhere except up, you will have to take the basket approach. You really don't know which year, which company will do better. But if you buy into uh, ICSA Pro Life, you, you have a HDFC Life and you have an SBI Life, you kind of got mostly 60-70% of the representation covered. So that's that's the way to kind of play this. And of course, LIC is being, doing its own bit in terms of reviving itself on a lot of counts. And I've seen the changes that they're making on the digital front. So, you know, that accessibility, the ease of uh, usage, renewals, all of that 
will also help them in some way. But of course, uh, you know, the private sector guys uh, definitely have much more demand, much more attractiveness from a stock perspective. And that's, that's where you could make some money in the next uh, year, year and a half as well. Okay, all right. Uh, Prakash, I wanted to ask you about JSPL. Uh, the stock has been quite strong. The problem with the company has been the promoter entity, right? There's always been that uncertainty post the coal block saga that took place close to around uh, 10 years or so ago. Now we have uh, the promoter entity that's got additional charge in the Ferris space itself. He's been appointed uh, about one of the top bodies in India here as the president. And also he's uh, moved to the BJP and will be contesting the Lok Sabha elections as well. Now, that it always has traded at a valuation discount. Do you think that this valuation discount can narrow? And also, we have seen that coking coal cost in the last week is down by close to 10%, which will be good for all, for all Ferris players. So, your pick. No, absolutely, Nigel. Lots happening uh, in this space. Uh, you know, while there is uh, the backdrop, is that there's news that the demand for steel makers is coming down in India. Things could be tough. Uh, but the the prices, the stock prices tell you a different story. And I've been talking about how Tata Steel and JSW Steel, which have very high efficient uh, efficiencies, you know, scaled up business models, are going to be favorably poised. JSP, of course, joins that uh, particular thing because one is, of course, you know, I'm not uh, sure whether you know just that change in the political stance is going to be uh, positive or negative, but it could be slightly positive for sure, if at least not negative. The other thing that's happening for JSPL is that they have a very scattered kind of a business model. They, the, the multiple facilities that they have, some of them are constrained for supply on uh, coking coal and the rest would have surpluses, so which they've been trying to kind of rationalize. So if that happens, because they don't have any large units in, in one or two places, unlike the other players. So that's, that's where they've taken a little bit of a time to lag behind this whole curve. But, uh, you know, by and large, if the government uh, is looking at spending so much on infrastructure, there's private capex that's likely to come. I don't see any reason why steel would be left behind. So uh, any dip in the steel uh, stocks is actually a good opportunity for you to buy. There, there seems to be some sort of a protection on the downside as, you know, the input prices also start kind of rationalizing. Uh, the, only, the only bummer in the case uh, is, is going to be if there's some policy around uh, you know, uh, if there's some change in the Chinese stance towards global steel uh, dumping. Now, if that were to happen, then things would look a bit different. But otherwise, I think it's it's fairly priced. And and this coal mine thing being resumed is going to help a lot of smaller companies also. If JSPL is not the only one. I mean, you, if you recall electro steel casting, you know, a lot, a lot of these guys, guys are waiting for uh, uh, a lot of, you know, proceeds to come from, you know, to the extent of 1,000 crores for a small company like electro steel makes such a big difference. So, those, those kind of things will start happening, but we'll have to wait and watch for it to actually flow in uh, to, to realize uh, how, how uh, attractive uh, it gets into the balance sheet. But I'm, I'm by and large very positive, but it'll be a bit of a tactical uh, acquisition. Okay, all right, Prakash, uh, stay on. We'll have more questions for you in just a bit. Uh, just rounding up to uh, almost 8.45, let's uh, bring in Anuj and talk about today's setup. Uh, Anuj, so welcome back from the Holi break. You know, as we were getting into the long weekend, there were some signs of stability in the internals that, you know, maybe the broader market correction is behind us. But how do you read the picture for today? Absolutely. So, good morning. Uh, though, you know, the break of uh, Holi after that, it never feels like it was a break. Uh, <laughs> you know, Holi is that kind of a festival. But uh, extremely important week uh, for starters uh, because it's expiry week, right? Uh, and uh, the basic view has been that uh, the markets made some kind of a bottom, both at the nifty level and even in the mid-caps. Uh, the indiscriminate one-way selling that we were seeing, that's come to an end. Uh, and decline for the nifty will resume only if you start to close below 21,710. On the upside, though, you need to take out 22,200, uh, uh, then the uptrend can resume. On the mid-caps, it's very interesting. But as I said, it's showing signs that perhaps that one-way correction has ended uh, and the market bed for the last two, three days has been quite good. And it's sustained. It's almost like a parallel line which is sustained, which is good. Uh, so keep an eye on that because that's going to be a very important cue. Now coming to the index, uh, because it's expiry week, uh, we are specifically mentioning levels. Uh, on the Nifty, the first support is 21,940 to 22,000 based on the options data. And then 21,710 to 21,840, the recent low. The upside comes in at uh, 22,150 to 22,180, uh, Friday's high. And then 22,225 to 22,275 based on the call options data. The bank Nifty is very interesting because uh, 
you know, after a long time, we'll have the monthly expiry also on Wednesday. Till now, the monthly expiry was happening for both Nifty and Bank Nifty on Thursday. This time, the Bank Nifty's monthly expiry is also on Wednesday. The first resistance is 46. 975 to 47,000 and then 47,250 to 47,350 and the supports lie at 46,550 to 46,600 and then 46,350 to 46,500 uh, and as always I'll leave you with thought for the day it's a solitude day today so there's a very interesting quote that came up uh, I would rather sit on a pumpkin and have it all to myself than be crowded on a velvet <laughs> cushion so have a good day all of you Thanks very much. Uh, and that's, that's a good thought to have as we get into trade today. Thanks, Anuj, for that. Uh, we do have to take a break on that note. Come back on the other side and uh, we will have Mitesh Thakkar and Sudarshan Sukhani join in. So we'll put a technical check to the market as well. Welcome back. Well, uh, let's uh, take a look at some more stocks that uh, could be in focus today. Uh, we have Interglobe Aviation on the radar and uh, Sonal has been looking into some details over there because they had a call with analysts not too long ago. Sonal, so what are the takeaways? Uh, well, they are planning uh, big growth going forward. So the company to the analyst said that they underlined the ambition to double by calendar year 30. This is through more planes, through more distribution. And they are also looking at routes including international now. The fleet addition also continued with eight more planes in Jan to Feb 2024. Now the total fleet size is around 366. They say FY 25 should see one plane coming per week in the fleet as well. So that's a big number. The management also believes that the recent slowdown that we have seen in passenger numbers as per DGCA, it is more a supply-led issue rather than demand because demand continues to be very strong for the industry. New airports in Noida and Navi Mumbai is something which will propel growth going forward and that is what the management is very bullish on. New guidance for FI25 with uh, average seat per kilometer per passenger growth is at 11 to 12 percent. So that's what the new guidance looks like for the company. Now, Jefferies on the back of this has upgraded the stock to a hold from an underperform. They've upgraded yields by 2 percent and EBITDA estimates by 4 14 to 16 percent for the company. However, Motilal Oswal says they have reiterated their neutral rating on the stock with a target price of 3,510 rupees a share. They say competition in the sector is expected to intensify with resurgence of Air India, the fleet that they are adding, and also the entry of a new player. So, this is why they continue to remain neutral on the stock. Okay, so Motilal is still neutral after that call. Got it, uh, Sonal. Thank you very much. Interglobe Aviation is going to be on the radar as well. <clears throat> Prakash, actually, before we talk about Interglobe, another stock that I wanted to discuss with you is Adani Ports. It's had a phenomenal 2024, right? It's one of the strongest stocks in the Adani stable. They've uh, snapped up another port now, this time on the East Coast. Uh, and I think they're paying about equity value. They're paying around uh, 1,300 crores thereabouts. Your thoughts on what has been a pretty strong performer? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and look at where it is from, you know, the, the carnage of last year. Uh, where, you know, this was probably the only stock which uh, wasn't under so much of a cloud in terms of doubting its uh, numbers and performance and all of that, because it's all real, right? Uh, we've seen uh, the cargo handling go up. They've, they've crossed phenomenal numbers. They've made new milestones in every passing quarter and month. And, and you know, the Dhamra acquisition, which uh, they paid uh, almost 9,100 crores uh, a few years back, took some time to actually operationalize. And when it has started doing, it's a significant contribution that it has the potential to make because of its vantage location. This Gopalpur port, again, uh, so we, let me tell you, is something which will uh, change the way trade happens from India. We, we haven't seen much of activity on the East Coast, uh, but the acquisition that they've been making, and, and even the JSW in, you know, infrastructure business is reached some 100 uh, million metric tons. It tells you that there's so much happening on the port side. Uh, that this this company will definitely uh, start kind of you know seeing some very very spectacular growth uh, numbers from here. I'm I'm quite positive on it, but you know the run up probably you know gives you a little bit of that bias. Uh, the price anchoring where you've seen much lower levels makes it difficult for people to buy into it. But on dips, this would definitely be something which you could add uh, going forward. Okay, all right, Prakash. Request you to stay with us. You've given us quite a bit of a fundamental analysis. Let's get in our uh, technical experts then to help us out with how they see trade panning out today. Mitesh as well as Sudarshan join us on the show. Good morning, gentlemen, and good to see you in. Well, Mitesh, you go first. What's your view on the index? You know, for starters, the gift 50 was suggesting 
maybe we pull back 40, 50 points odd. How would you approach trade? Good morning, Ali. Uh, my sense is that, you know, we had some long bias positions on the index over the weekend. For Thursday and Friday, I think the markets were bouncing back from lower levels, coming out of oversold readings. But this is not showing any signs of starting a new trend. So I think the markets have done that. They've come out of the oversold levels. And now I think they could be sideways in a consolidation. So 22, 250 is the important level for me to watch on the upside till that is being crossed. I don't think there's a new trend starting on the up move. And on the downside, 21, 900. So I think it could be a range of about 300, 350 points in which the index would consolidate. Okay, that's uh, the terms of how Mitesh is reading the levels. So Darshan, hi, good morning. Uh, what about you? Do you think that... Uh, the uh, the bigger indices, Nifty or the bank Nifty, is there a trade on either one of them? Yeah, good morning. I would say that the Nifty and the bank Nifty both have a trade. The Nifty itself has been in a trading range after that big decline. That range has lasted for almost seven trading days. So uh, the markets are giving a message, at least for the short term, they are finding a low somewhere around 21,700. And then we don't know what happens later. But if that short-term low is in place, then there are intraday buying opportunities in the Nifty, buy on minor dips, at least for the day. The bank Nifty has been an outperformer for the last three, four days. It did not fall out as much as the Nifty. I would also consider a positional trade on the long side in the bank Nifty. So till 21,700 holds, the trade is to be on the long side. Uh, gentlemen, morning. Sudarshan, what would your stock recommendations be? Well, I start with Hindalco, where a trading range has broken on the upside. Buy with a stop under 513. Sun Pharma, which is probably heading for new highs. Again, a long trading range broke on the upside on Friday. So buy with a stop under 1527. My only intraday short is Startup Power, which is uh, not participating in any kind of rally and suggests a distribution. Intraday short with a stop above 404. And finally, I have Apollo Hospital, a very handsome breakout on Friday. That should uh, continue, and that message is that the small dip is over. Buy with a stop under 59.78. Okay, got that, Sudarshan. Uh, Mitesh, let me come to you as well. Good morning. Uh, in terms of stocks, what are you looking at this morning? Good morning. I have uh, a few buy calls and a sell call as well. So on the buying side is Indus Tower. I think that's a stock now showing signs of a medium to long term uptrend. So uh, you can keep taking trading positions. Currently, would recommend buying with a stop at 265 for targets of 285. Chola Finance is a buy with a stop at 1070 for targets of 1130. And Dixon is something which I would recommend if it starts to get past the levels of 7200. Buy then with the 50, 60 point kind of a stop loss and look for 7350 as the first target. And on the sell side is AB Capital. Recommend selling with a stop at 178 half for targets of 167. Okay, thank you very much for that. Sneha Seth of the Derivatives Research Analyst at Angel One is also with us on the show now. Uh, Sneha, good morning. Important week, a short one, boxed in between two holidays, but it's an important one. Today you've got the uh, you know, Nifty Financial Services expiry. On Thursday you also have the monthly expiry. What's the setup looking now? See, uh, very good morning. Uh, if we look at the uh, recovery, what we saw in Friday session, I think uh, things have been changed. We have seen uh, decent writing and put options. 22,000, 22,100 could also add a decent positions. For now, it will be important to see whether we surpass 22,200 on the closing basis. Any move beyond this zone uh, would be interesting to watch out and we may see some stocks giving a very strong move. So uh, wait and watch for now. The levels on the higher side is important to watch out for now. In individual counters, if we see we have a two buy call, first one is store and power. Uh, if we see this counter has a, has made a strong base around 1200, 1220 odd zone. So I believe we can go ahead and long this counter with a strict stop loss around 1218 and the target expected will be around 1398. Apart from this, Apollo Hospital has given a breakout on Friday. Uh, I think this counter has formed a strong base around, uh, you know, uh, 6,200 odd zone. So I think we can go ahead and long this counter as well with a strict stop loss of 6,230. Uh, 6, and the target expected would be around 6,574. All right, got that. Thank you very much uh, for those uh, trading ideas there on the FNO side. We do have to take a very quick break. We will come back on the other side, get you some more market cues and uh, 
Bino Patham Parapil of Elara Securities will join in. We'll talk about the pharma space and some of the stocks that he likes. Welcome back. This is Bazaar Open Exchange live from the CNBC TV 18 Motilal Oswal studio. We're prepping you up uh, for the first trading day of this truncated week. And let me now go across to Vamakshi, who has Crompton Consumer on her radar. And this is because they held an analyst meet. Vamakshi, what were the key takeaways? Well, absolutely, the stock will be in focus. There's some very strong commentary coming in from the management of Crompton Greaves uh, Consumer. Uh, they have highlighted that they will be focusing on attaining long-term, sustainable, double-digit growth across all businesses. And this growth, mind you, will not be largely driven by price cuts, but instead, they will be focusing on premiumization, strong new product pipeline, balanced channel mix, ad spends, as well as key leadership hirings. Overall, they have highlighted that the business could double in the next five years. Operating leverage will naturally kick in and therefore, Margin expansion is also what the management is expecting. Moreover, they are also targeting to enter new segments, which will in fact expand their total addressable market by almost 50,000 crores to 1.5 lakh crore, and this is over the next 4 to 5 years. As far as Butterfly is concerned, they have said that most channel restructuring should be done by the first quarter of next financial year. In fact, they are targeting to become the largest player in the kitchen appliance industry in the next 3 to 4 years, and EBITDA margins could actually touch uh, double digits in the second half of the next financial year. Year. On, on fans, they said that the summer has started early. They're expecting some good demand uh, for fans. In fact, they're targeting to increase the premium share from 26% currently to 40%. And the fans category could actually post double digit growth over the medium term. So, given all of those factors, Nomura actually has a neutral rating, target price of 320 rupees per share, but very strong commentary coming in from the management. Okay, all right, Vamakshri got that. Thanks very much uh, for joining in on Crompton. So maybe some margin expansion coming as we get into FY26. Uh, Prakash Crompton now hasn't really been much of a wealth creator. You know, even in a year where the mid-cap index is up some 60%, the stock has been extremely choppy and volatile. Now there are some reports suggesting that we may have a bumper monsoon this year because of La Nina. Your thoughts on Crompton? So, yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, Crompton, there, there's something that seems to be cooking up. Their focus on kitchen appliances... Uh, can definitely help. There's a vast market. Uh, it's just that they need to kind of establish themselves uh, with the Butterfly brand with that quality assurance that they come with their own brand. Uh, but uh, whether it will, you know, this move will have fans uh, to buy into the stock, I'm not too sure. And what happens is, you know, people bought into it with a huge expectation that this will go the same way as Crompton uh, Power did. Uh, yeah, you know, CG Power did. I mean, that powered up for uh, various other reasons, which were absolutely disparate from what, uh, you know, Crompton Consumer would have to face. So it will take some time, is my guess. And and I, I wouldn't buy something in anticipation of a good monsoon because they're far more uh, clear beneficiaries of that. Uh, because the broad consumption pattern hasn't yet changed, especially in the semi-urban rural markets. So, you know, that data doesn't really seem very encouraging as yet. But yes, it's good to see that the companies finally trying to get its act together in terms of uh, meeting those expectations. But uh, still too early to actually get a buy uh, uh, kind of a indication from this thing. Oh, okay. All right, uh, got that. Prakash, thanks very much. Great to have you on this morning. You have a good trading day and we look forward to connecting again soon. Well, the first of the pre-open trades will start coming in. I'm looking out for some of the life insurance stocks and there's a little bit of green to start off with. Max Financial, 2% higher. Uh, there is, uh, SBI Life is very, very flat right now. Let's look at HDFC Life and what that is throwing up. Uh, because remember, yeah, there's some green 1.5% up on HD, uh, HDFC Life because the um, the surrender value uh, final rules that have come in, they're not as onerous, not as uh, troublesome for life insurers as was being uh, earlier feared. The surrender value in the first three years actually doesn't change. Maybe it'll even be a little lower than what was uh, there in, in place earlier. So that's something in focus. Other than that, I mean, right now, the Nifty will take some time to settle down because some of the rates are still all over the place. ICICI Bank, Titan, uh, Reliance down 3, 3.5%. 3 so I think it's it's just uh, very early. Let's uh, wait for those rates to, to settle and then we'll come back to it. But in the meantime, uh, let's uh, put the spotlight on the pharma sector now. 
According to Alara Securities, the sector uh, returns may not be as great as seen in the last one year. And valuations are also quite high after the recent strong stock price performance. Bino uh, Patim Parimpil, analyst uh, of the pharma sector and also the head of research at Ilara Securities is with us. Bino, good morning. Thank you for joining in. So, you know, when we had this bout of market volatility, when there was a lot of mid-cap, small-cap correction going on, that is when there was a, you know, propensity to go back to pharma stocks. But tell us why you think that the returns may not be as high this year. Is it just a valuation issue? Or is there an underlying business reason to it as well? Oh, good morning. Uh, so uh, last one year, we saw that uh, a few things quite a bit changed in the pharma sector, which also led to the valuation re-rating in the sector. One was mainly the U.S. generics business. Uh, for most companies, the U.S. generics business <clears throat> grew much faster than expected. Um, there was improvement in profitability in that business. Uh, this led to a significant uh, earnings upgrades in most of the large pharma companies, which has a large presence in the U.S. market. Uh, coming to the domestic market, uh, we started off FY24 with a very weak growth in the domestic market, uh, which also in the last quarter in Q3, we have seen a significant pickup in the domestic market growth rates. Uh, looking at other areas in the healthcare as well, hospital uh, segment growth also continued to be strong. So all these led to some uh, earnings upgrades in the sector, uh, which uh, led to valuation expansion as well. Uh, and last year, we have seen a very big return in the sector uh, in the index overall in the healthcare index. Uh, going forward, I wouldn't expect that sort of earnings upgrades to happen. Also, valuations having re-rated quite a bit. Um, we may not see significant returns coming from valuation rating also from these levels. But at the same time, uh, you know, the earnings growth continues, the U.S. generic uh, market continues to be strong and could even further improve from here on. Um, and the domestic market growth could also stabilize at uh, 8 to 10 percent uh, or 11 percent uh, as uh, expectations are. So that can continue to um, uh, give returns from these stocks, but it cannot be um, as high as what we saw in the last 12 months in my view. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Aurobindo Pharma is up 134% in the last one year. It's a 138% rally in the last one year for Zydis. It's a triple-digit up move for Lupin. Uh, across the board, you're seeing a 50, 60, 70% kind of a move for Alchem, Alembic. Um, even something like a Sun Pharma has given a return of 60%. Bino, you spoke about premium valuations now after this kind of an up move. Could you put the valuations in context? Where do they stand right now? How does it compare with historical levels? And why do you think, you know, the valuations from here on, um, you know, I mean, have we hit peak valuations for the pharmaceutical stocks? Sure. Uh, when we look at pharma, uh, company valuations, we also have to uh, consider a few things like uh, in the U.S. generic business, there are often big products that are part of the, uh, the current profit uh, of the company. Uh, some of it may be recurring, some of it may not be recurring. So we need to do a bit of adjustments. Uh, if we do a bit of those adjustments and look at the companies, uh, most of the large companies, uh, maybe except for Aurobindo, are trading uh, about 30 times one year forward in my uh, assessment. Um, this is a significant improvement in valuations uh, over the last five, six year time frame, uh, and close to the peak levels, which we last saw uh, probably in the 2014, 15 time frame. Uh, so yes, we are quite close to the uh, peak valuations, uh, but for the time being, I do not see any significant risk of correction uh, also because I expect some more earnings upgrades to continue uh, at a slower pace, though, over the next two quarters. All right. Hi, Vino. Good morning. Good to see you. And, uh, Vino, what about Bocart? You know, that one, uh, it appears there is some promise right now. They came in, they raised money, which got lapped up as well. Any view on the stock? Any triggers, if, if at all, that you're tracking? I do not have a coverage on the stock, uh, but I believe that they have one innovator drug in the antibiotic space, uh, which uh, is promising, uh, but all depends on how well the clinical study results for the drug uh, come out to be. Mm. Okay. Uh, Bino, do you look at, uh, have you seen the latest news flow on Lupin, where they plan to transfer the trade generics business in India to their wholly owned subsidiary? 
uh, well, the total amount they receive is not very high, 120 crore. But what's the significance of this for Lupin? And do you also look at Mankind Pharma? And your thoughts on Chris Capital exiting with this block deal, which is expected today of 2.9% stake? Sure. Uh, so uh, the uh, transaction in Lupin is uh, between the subsidiary and the parent. So I don't think it is very significant from a stock price perspective. Many companies do that uh, 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 to streamline their business processes. Um, and in some cases, maybe uh, sometime down the line, there could be uh, potential for value unlocking, et cetera. Um, so um, as of now, I believe this is a process of uh, streamlining of the business processes. Uh, Mankind Pharma uh, has uh, done well. Uh, the growth, um, it's a relatively more domestic market focused pharma company, um, which uh, is taking, getting the benefit from improvement in growth rates in the domestic pharma market. Um, like the market after a lull early 2024, um, early FY 2024, uh, we have seen growth pick up significantly in Q3 uh, and the stock has also done well uh, in the last 12 months. Um, naturally, uh, some of the early investors in the company would be looking to book profit uh, and private equity players will have their timelines to um, close the fund exit, exit uh, investments, etc. Um, so I wouldn't think uh, that has anything to do with the fundamentals of the company. Sure. So Bino, to just wrap it up, uh, given everything that you said, which stocks would remain your top picks? You know, they say that uh, at times it's worthwhile paying for even a high PE stock as long as growth keeps coming in. So not sure if that holds true for, let's say, a Divi's or not. Or should you look at something like a Dr. Reddy's, uh, where prices haven't moved and there is some valuation comfort? Sure. Um, uh, despite the run-up in stock prices, I believe um, uh, Cyrus, Life Science, and Sun Pharma look attractive given the uh, solid uh, up, up, up cycle we are seeing in the U.S. generics market. Um, same with Aurobindo as well. Aurobindo may have uh, some uh, valuation catch-up also to do, uh, giving a little extra bit of returns, uh, although there is a little bit of risk from the uh, uh, potential FDA action on their plan, which was inspected in February. Um, Dr. Reddy's has uh, underperformed other companies uh, in the last few months, uh, so uh, the valuation looks uh, relatively better than what it was six months back, uh, although one has to keep in mind that Dr. Reddy's has a higher contribution from generic revenue, which is more of one-off one in the U.S., um, I would also look at uh, start looking at positively on the domestic focused pharma companies where the market growth has picked up. Uh, it has not run up as much uh, like the U.S. focused pharma companies in the last two three months. So uh, some sort of relative valuation comfort is emerging there as well. Uh, we have seen the diagnostic space also uh, the stocks correcting in the last two three months. Possibly some uh, sort of valuation comfort is emerging there as well. Uh, Bino, thank you very much for your perspective and insights. Have a good trading week. Uh, it's 9.10. Uh, let's quickly get some trading calls from Sudarshan and Midesh. Sudarshan, hi. Well, consider buying Apollo Hospitals with a stop under 59.78. And Mitesh, your 9.10 call? So buy on Indus Travel with a stop at 265. Okay, thank you very much for that. Now to the Momentumizer stock of the day. Ekta joins in. Ekta. Thanks for that. Well, I'm looking at Amboy Enterprises. It's a part of the S&P BSC 500 market cap of close to around 12,000 odd crores. The stock was up around 4.2% on Friday, around 17.57% of deliverable quantity to traded quantity is what we saw in the NSE. The stock, in fact, has rallied 102% from its 52-week low, which it hit on the 27th of March 2023, which is last year. The stock, in fact, however, has corrected 23% from its 52-week high, which it hit on the 31st of Jan, stood at around 4,600 odd rupees. Now, uh, the news on the 21st for Amber Enterprises was positive, where they've entered into a 50% JV with Resu Jet for manufacturing of fully automatic uh, top and front loaded washing machines and the company says that this will expand their footprint into consumer durables and beyond room air conditioners so maybe we could probably see some amount of momentum continue
for this particular counter. Okay, keep an eye on that one, Ekra. Thanks a lot for that. Mangalam joins us to tell us about ICIC Securities. They have come out with a note on DMART as well as Nestle. Mangalam, tell us more. Well, it's an interesting note that has come in and uh, the second positive note on DMART in the last five days or so before after C CLSA is initiating coverage. So ICIC Securities has upgraded DMART from hold to add and they've maintained their hold on Nestle. They expect DMART to outperform Nestle in the medium term. They've increased the DMART earnings estimates for the next two years by about 2 to 4 percent as well. And on DMART itself, uh, they've increased the target price from 4100 to 4800. Now you'd wonder why is it that they're comparing DMART to Nestle? Because over the long period of time, they've been tracking DMART's valuation premium over Nestle. And that has actually reduced from 50 percent from two years ago to about 8 percent after the underperformance that DMART has seen. And add to that, DMART's problems have uh, been largely in the price with limited downside risk. In fact, if you compare that to the other FMCG companies on a revenue front as well, DMART may not be growing at pre-COVID levels of almost 30%. Uh, it's still growing at 18 to 20%, which is higher than all the other FMCG companies with healthy net profit margin. On the other hand, for Nestle, they believe that the positives have played out. In fact, for Nestle in the near future, they expect time correction. And the revenue out growth outperformance that Nestle was showing over the last few quarters may also now decelerate largely because the price hikes are in the base itself. So, which is why it is an unusual comparison, but on the quantitative parameters, they believe that now it's time for DMART to outperform Nestle, hence the upgrade coming in there. Okay, thank you very much for that. UBS has written an interesting note on telecom. And after a long time, you're seeing an upgrade on Vodafone Idea. So UBS has raised the target price on Bharti Airtel to 1,310, though they continue to maintain a neutral rating on Bharti Airtel given its premium valuation. But on Vodafone Idea, they've raised the target price to 13 rupees 10 paise, but they've also upgraded it from a sell to a neutral. Now, the key reason behind the you know, target price increase for both Bharti Airtel and Vodafone Idea is the expectation of a tariff hike. According to UBS, it should come in Q1 of FI25 and they're building in a 10% tariff increase. One, elections will be out of the way and plus a potential IPO from GEO um, you know, incentivizes Reliance GEO also to go ahead for a tariff increase and the others perhaps will also follow suit. On Vodafone Idea, the reason for the upgrade is one, the stock has underperformed and the recent announcements seem to suggest that the company is close to securing a sizable funding of 45,000 crore rupees, which could help accelerate its capex, narrow its network gap. But the bell has gone and the Nifty has opened with a cut of about 89 points. So after three days of gains, the markets have opened the sh holiday shortened week with a cut of about 0.3%. Um, remember, Wall Street too took a bit of a breather and the benchmark indices has opened with a cut. The big drag is coming in from the FMCG names. The Nifty FMCG index has opened in the red. Britannia is your top loser. That's down close to about 1.3%. Nestle, HUL, weak in trade. HDFC Bank is nursing some losses. SBI Life is weak in trade. We're going to watch for HDFC Life. And yes, that's the top Nifty gainer after, you know, the breather, the relief that's come through on the surrender value. Um, so it's not going to be as onerous as the market was fearing. And HDFC Life is the top nifty gainer, 2% up on that. Adani Ports, uh, after they've made that acquisition of nearly 1,300 crore rupees, Adani Ports is seeing some strength today. Uh, the mid-cap index opened in the red, but now is back in the green. All in all, it's a muted start in line with what uh, the pre-open was suggesting. It's about 40, 50 points down <coughs> on the nifty cut of about a quarter of a percent. All right, Rima, a few stocks that are moving around. Mankind Pharma, the stock is down close to around 3%. Massive volumes out there. I think that large trade has taken place. Keep an eye out on that stock. It's down 3% because of that reason. Now, show Leyland, yesterday they've announced a 4 rupee 95 paise dividend. And the record date they have fixed is 3rd of April. So, explains why that stock as well is up close to around a percent. Now, you'll be wondering that HDFC Life is the biggest gainer on the Nifty, while uh, SBI Life is the biggest loser. The reason is that SBI life gets least impacted because of these regulations. And also that could be now a bit of a switch. So you have SBI life actually that's underperforming while HDFC life is outperforming. Yash tells me that in case those regulations did come about, revised regulations did come about, HDFC life would be the one that gets the hardest hit. Now that's not come about. So actually HDFC life is seeing some bit of a relief in today's trading session. A couple of other big uh, stocks that are moving around, Max Financial. It has valuation support as well. This uh, no change in terms of regulations has come as a positive. So that's the big winner. You know, if you pull up a valuation parameter, you'll see it's trading at a sharp discount in comparison to its peers. So that's up close to 5.5%. ICICI Prudential as well up close to 
and Indus Star. Just take a look at the way that stock has moved. In the last seven trading sessions, it's moved from around 230 to around 278. There is uh, that wait for a large trade to take place, but in the meanwhile, the stock is flying away. And as we highlighted earlier today as well, JSPL, well, fundamentally things looking up for the steel sector because there is a correction in the raw material cost. The problem is steel prices are not moving up, but the promoter entity, that's Mr. Naveen Jindal, has joined the ruling party BJP and he'll contest Lok Sabha elections. The stock normally gets a bit of a discount in comparison to its peers because of political uncertainty. Maybe that's a little behind them now and that's why the stock is looking up to an upper percent higher in today's session. Surabhi. Uh, it's all about the broader market recovery. I mean, I think uh, that's what started towards the end of last week and that seems to be playing out even now. So if we talk about uh, some more names, uh, the, the movers and shakers, so to speak, watch out for Interglobe Aviation. After the analyst meet, uh, some of the brokerages, Jefferies, for instance, they've upgraded their targets. Now they have, a, I, I think, a hold rating earlier. They had a you know, negative rating on the stock. And they've upgraded their EBITDA estimates uh, by almost 12-13% as well. So Interglobe is holding out quite okay. Uh, the insurers, as uh, you know, Nigel also mentioned, Max is retaining that 6% gain. ICICI Prudential Life, 3-3.5% three, three higher. So that's the other one to look out for. Vedanta, Nigel was telling us, I mean, that it's after six long years, we'll see some resumption Goa mining. But he also, you know, told us a very important context. That qualitatively, it doesn't move the needle much, the kind of, uh, you know, iron ore you get in Goa. But anyway, for what it's worth, there's a little bit of green on that stock as well. Let's move beyond and see what else is moving in the broader markets because that's where the the churn seems to be Avenue Supermart, some of the brokerage upgrades that Manglam was talking about, they're working well on the stock, 2% higher. Indus Towers is up 1.5%. Remember, Indus was a long call that Mitesh gave us on the technicals, saying that he sees a bit of a breakout. So that, uh, that call is working well. Some of the other insurance players as well, New India Assurance is up and about. KPIT Tech is having a good early morning, 2% higher. Uh, look at EIH, NBCC, there's Dr. Lal, Path Labs, Jyoti CNC, the, the recent listing, 6.5%, 7% higher. So basically... The broader market seems to be alive and kicking. And the large cap screen, not bad actually. We've managed to recover quite well from the first initial cut. The Nifty is just about 30 odd points negative now. And watch out for some of the tech names. Look at HCL Tech, smart intraday recovery from the opening lows. Even Wipro for that matter. Remember, that's the question that we were putting up as we started. Whether the whole reaction to Accenture, whether that was done and dusted in one day. Uh, because the important caveat there is that Accenture did a guidance cut, but the year ends in August. Mm. And a lot of these companies are talking about recovery in the second half, which means, you know, August and, be and beyond. So maybe it's not really apple to oranges, just looking at the time, uh, time horizon. Mm. So IT seems to be looking at some recovery as well. And just one word on Mankind Pharma. You know, I'm looking at a Novama alternate and quant desk research report that's come about. They're saying post this 3% that's changed hands. You know, the revised shareholding for the March quarter, that's reported by April 16th, which in all probability should happen. Then the stock automatically would qualify for the MSCI May 2024 review. So that's the reason why the stock has recovered a little bit from the low point of the day post that deal. The free float will increase and that's what helps it get into the MSCI review as well. So that's a stock that I'm looking at. Another one that we're looking at is, uh, you know, IMFA, that's Indian Metals. They announced very, very late in the Friday's trading session that they'll be considering a special dividend in the next couple of years. Things that are working for them, well, they have got some part of that compensation from JSPL. So that's why they're going to be considering that special dividend. And ferrochrome prices have moved up. And as I told you earlier, for the some of these users of coking coal, it's good news because coking coal costs are down by close to 10% in the last seven to around eight sessions. So explains why some of these stocks are doing very, very well. Well, I for finance and GM Financial are also weak in trade. It's straight away open with a cut of about two to three percent. Remember, they will they're likely to face more RBI scrutiny. The central bank has floated an e-tender to seek interest from firms to conduct a special audit on GM Financial and IFL Finance for the regulatory lapses, uh, whether it was related to gold loan disbursement or the IPO financing. Um, so I think on 12th of April is what the RBI has said, that the special audit will be conducted on these two firms. And there is that regulatory overhang as they face more scrutiny. And these are two stocks which are under pressure today. Yeah. You know, one more to add to the list, and it's an interesting one. BB Fintech. Now, stock's flat. It's not doing anything this morning. Mm. But remember that Bima Sugam has been launched along with this whole surrender value new norms. What is Bima Sugam? Basically, it's a giant, you know, aggregator portal where you can buy insurance and, you know, get serviced as well. So from the face of it, it looks like a bit of a competitor uh, to the kind of business model that PB Fintech has going. And it's all about margins. And this being a 
you know, wide UPI kind of platform, maybe there's going to be a bit of a margin crunch. We'll see how it plays out. But PB Fintech has done exceedingly well in the last one year. And for the time being, it's not showing any sort of a major negative reaction to the launch of this uh, big uh, sort of uh, portal from IRADAI. But let's move on and welcome our market master now on the show, Harish Krishnan. Uh, is joining in. He's, of course, the Senior Fund Manager at Equities at Kotak AMC. Harish, great to have you on the show. Let me ask you the most difficult question. Is the mid-cap small cap correction over? You know, and I mean, just to expand on that, really, I think uh, markets and investors, newer investors get really jittery, even with a 5-10% kind of a decline. But it was a bit of a scare. Uh, what do you think, uh, you know, are we, are, are we past the worst, basically? Uh, so, right, uh, there has been a small correction for sure, uh, but we've still come back to levels which were there in, say, December of 2023. So, such has been the extent of the parabolic move that we've seen that, uh, you know, this uh, correction, while welcome in terms of clearing away some of the froth, uh, has just brought us back to the levels which were there in December of 23. Um, I think from an overall sense, while we positive on the economic construct, uh, the fact that we've got counter-cyclical both the, on the monetary side as well as on the fiscal side. So therefore, you you do, uh, you know, you're seeing growth, which is without steroids, which is very welcome. Uh, on the other hand, the only negative, uh, if, if one main could be that the sentiment uh, is extremely exuberant, even as, uh, even post this correction. So I think it's only about uh, how do we marry the entry price uh, to, to put in uh, reasonably large sums of capital uh, so that the uh, underlying experience for our investors over the course of the next three, five years uh, becomes a lot, lot better. So while uh, uh, it is welcome, uh, I think some of the froth has gone off. Uh, of course, when the index corrects by about 10, 12 percent, a lot more stocks fall anywhere between, say, 20, 30 percent. And therefore, it provides some opportunities uh, for us to add on to some exposures across various sectors. Mm. Uh, you are, in a way, betting on metals also, Harish. I was listening to some of your previous interactions, and metals is a sector which you've classified as a dark horse. Now, this is a bit of a contra trade. Not too many, you know, the consensus opinion is not very bullish on metals. So can you take us through your view there? So metals is uh, clearly, as you uh, rightly uh, coined it, it's a dark horse trade, it's a contrarian trade. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, is predicated on what China does, given the fact that it's the largest consumer and supplier of metals. Um, so the, the sense that we have is twofold. Uh, one is that, uh, you know, uh, obviously, given the extent of push that China has seen, uh, you know, with respect to its economic construct, we do think that it's quite conceivable that we can see some kind of uh, uh, follow through from the government uh, in terms of some policy easing. Now, whether it's going to be a big bank fixed asset uh, investment creation, which was the case in the last decade, possibly not, but uh, at least there's going to be some kind of a pushback, that is uh, that is one uh, conjecture. The second is that uh, a lot of Indian companies have come uh, in this cycle with very little debt. Um, so unlike the previous cycles where, uh, you know, the Indian companies also got hit uh, by significant amount of debt that they were carrying, this time around there is uh, limited uh, debt on their balance sheets. The ba balance sheet health of most Indian uh, metal companies are uh, in fine fiddle. And therefore, uh, you know, it, it kind of limits the downside from a meaningful point of view. The third aspect is, you know, from an ownership point of view, uh, we do think that there is very little ownership in the space and therefore that provides uh, a reasonable sense of, uh, you know, uh, a, a better uh, risk reward and a slightly higher margin of safety. And which is why we think from a medium term perspective, uh, we, we are wanting to take some exposure into the metal space. All right. Uh... Hi, Harish. Good morning and good to see you. An interesting call out there. Under ownership and balance sheets in much better shape than what we have seen in the previous cycle. And that's one of the reasons why you're positive. Quick question since we're talking about metals. Ferris or non-ferris, what do you prefer? Uh, so ideally, it would be non-ferrous given the uh, the significant extent of usage, uh, you know, across industries. We are going through this massive electrification drive across the world, and therefore, uh, you know, it, it genuinely uh, does uh, prefer the non-ferrous. But uh, I guess, uh, you know, by and large, metals move as a homogeneous pack. It isn't that uh, you know uh, they, there's too much of distinction from a price action point of view. But from a slightly longer term construct, uh, we do prefer the non-ferrous over the. Fair
Got it. And you know, for the non-ferrous space, you also have the dollar play out there. A weaker dollar will be good news for LME prices, which could help them. So we got that. What about, you know, I wanted to ask you, Harish, besides sectors and themes, there is some kind of cautiousness with regard to earnings growth. Because we did see margin expansion, but top line growth wasn't that good. So part of the street is saying, hey, maybe bulk of this margin expansion is now behind us. And the top line growth doesn't look like it's going to come as much as anticipated. Do you think there's a risk to FY25 earnings or do you think we'll be fine? I think it's a reasonably fair construct. Now, uh, we do think that, uh, you know, the top line growth has been sluggish across sectors. So, uh, you know, while we can talk about headline numbers, I think what's more important for us is the breadth of the earnings across, say, the top 200 companies. And we've definitely seen a sluggish top line growth across multiple sectors, uh, notably on the consumption side. I think investment as a theme is still doing quite well uh, when we look at both from a top line construct. Obviously, over there, the bigger construct is that of the order inflow. And that that definitely is streaming to do much better. But uh, clearly, from a uh, you know uh, top line point of view, I think uh, there's a greater pressure in terms of consumption. So, uh, and that that obviously uh, feeds into multiple sectors and subsectors. Uh, so we are a bit sanguine on the fact that you know that that is one area which is kind of slowing down. Um, of course, uh, uh, you know uh, whether it can see some kind of pullback. I think it's also a function that uh, you know, especially in consumption, uh, there's been a significant amount of margin increase that has happened across the board, uh, especially on the FMCG pack. And therefore, we do think that, uh, you know, there is going to be some kind of price uh, correction that needs to happen to excite back the customer. And uh, therefore, we do think that, you know, without, uh, uh, you know, margin, uh, without top line uh, coming through, uh, even margins are at risk uh, for a lot of these companies. So uh, the broader call out is uh, clearly investment over consumption at uh, um, uh, from our perspective. And uh, within that, obviously, uh, sectors which are more geared towards uh, government and private capex as well as on the real estate side is what we think, uh, you know, are in better shape at this point of time. Arish, uh, two PSU sectors where we've seen a parabolic up move have been one, defence, and the other one is uh, railways, where we have seen greater spend by the government on defence and railways. Uh, the order wins have been exceedingly strong. But the question now is on valuations. And are they comfortable or uncomfortable, even if you have a longer term time horizon? Where do you stand on defence and railways? I think uh, we have a lot more circumspect on both of these. Uh, so if you look at, say, defense, uh, you know, uh, and I'm just talking about index level, say, NSE index uh, on defense is trading on a price to book of close to about 10 times. Uh, it is even higher than the price to book of, say, the NSE consumption index. Uh, now, these are very rarefied uh, entry level multiples. So while there's a lot positive going on, including the export opportunity that Indian defense companies can cater to, as well as the indigenization drive that the government is focusing on. And uh, obviously, defense is a very topical uh, point today, given the geopolitical scenario that's there. We are, we think that, you know, the, the uh, current uh, valuations pretty much cap out uh, any prospect of, uh, of, uh, of, you know, further uh, uh, medium term value creation. So we are a bit circumspect on both of these uh, within the broader uh, PSU pack. Okay. So Sanjay, you know, overall, <clears throat> given the the construct and uh, sort of what we are in for, I think the next event now is obviously we get into earnings, and then finally uh, the you know the election event. Uh, for for Q4, what are you expecting? Because Q3 we came off fairly okay. I mean, there weren't too many disappointments. So in the near term, next uh, three to four months, as we get through this event season, uh, you know, how are you expecting the market to behave? So near term is anyone's guess, and I guess we are no wiser uh, than uh, than at least many others on the street. Uh, so uh, what is it that we are looking forward to from uh, from assessing whether our medium term thesis is right? Is uh, primarily as uh, as rightly called out in the previous question as well. Uh, is uh, in terms of whether uh, there is uh, you know volume growth coming back, especially on consumption side. That's a that's a key yard, uh, yardstick that we are looking at across sectors as to where. 
where is the volume growth? Uh, because it's been a bit elusive. Um, obviously, there's been a significant inflationary push, uh, you know, from a pre-COVID to a post-COVID level. And uh, you know, uh, to a certain extent, that may have impacted volume. So uh, volume growth is definitely a key area. Uh, if I look at uh, other sectors, I think auto is something where uh, we've seen a reasonable amount of persistence of demand. Um, and uh, especially as far as the passenger car vehicle and to a certain extent two-wheeler. Uh, what we are slightly more sanguine is on the agri side and on the CV side. Uh, so that's as far as the auto side is concerned. Um, as far as uh, investment, uh, like I said, uh, obviously government is a very big enabler and a catalyst and is also a big spender on, uh, on the investment side. And therefore, it's very important to see uh, you know, the contours of uh, the political formation that does come through over the course of the next three, four months. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously, uh, um, you know, a similar government formation with a focus on investment uh, is therefore welcome from a from a medium term construct because it does bring in the productivity benefits uh, that can help uh, catalyze the overall economic activity for a longer runway. So investment is something that we continue to keep a watchful eye on. Uh, uh, over there, we are more uh, focused incrementally on private capex as to how that is shaping up uh, just in terms of numbers. Uh, you know, pre-COVID, this number used to be about 6 lakh crores for the listed uh, companies. Uh, it has moved now to close to about 8 lakh crores. Uh, we think that there is still room for a meaningful increase in terms of the private capex. And therefore, we need a conducive enabling framework to persist, uh, which will see us there. So that's uh, something that we look out for. The third area is clearly that of the export basket. Now, uh, this is something which is more driven by what's happening in the geopolitical landscape as well as, uh, you know, in the advanced economies uh, from a perspective of whether uh, they are going to see some kind of a slowdown. Um, from, a, from a U.S. market, uh, we do see actually a stronger resilience and a pushback uh, to the slowdown narrative. And uh, to a certain extent, while that can kind of delay the rate cut uh, theory, uh, but I think uh, a stronger nominal growth does actually benefit the export uh, push through uh, even in the near term. So uh, export is an area of opportunity for us. Uh, we are positive on pharma and healthcare. Uh, we are looking out in terms of, uh, you know, price stability in the generics basket, as well as in terms of API correction. So I think that's the area of opportunity for us. Uh, what we are uh, watching out for is on the chemical side, where there's been a significant amount of pain in the last two, three years. Uh, and we are watchful of uh, how the geopolitical landscape comes through, uh, so as to take a slightly more constructive view over there. So it's uh, it's across a whole range of sectors, but that's, that's what we are looking out uh, when we assess the next three, four months. Got it, Harish. Appreciate you joining in and giving us your view on all those uh, sectors that we discussed. Uh, Wishing you a good day ahead, and we look forward to having a chat with you rather soon. Well, let's focus, though, on the life insurance space. And Yash has been on top of that one. He's joining in to give us a quick revision of what the street was fearing with regard to regulations coming on the life insurers. And it's not come about. That's why we have a few of these talks that are celebrating. Yash, put into context. Well, Nigel, the regulations that we're talking about are with respect to surrender value. What is surrender value? It's a, a price that is given uh, to the policyholder in case of voluntary and early surrender of policies. Now, in December 2023, the regulator had come out with a proposal, uh, you know, which spoke about increasing the surrender value and the increase was significant, about two times of what exists today. Of course, that put a significant pressure on all the life insurance companies. They were back and forth and now finally, in terms of final regulations, what we have from the regulator is a watered version, a completely watered version of what had been proposed in December 2023. What the regulator has done is practically brought back the surrender value to the point as it exists today. So no increase in that sense uh, across, uh, you know, the parameters in terms of time parameters for surrender value. Uh, now what this does is it removes the majority of the overhang from life insurance companies in terms of uh, a potential increase uh, in what they would have had to pay uh, to their policyholders in case of surrenders and reduces the uh, the margin pressure also which could have come about with this particular increase. Now what the regulator said is that they will have graded surrender value which means as the policy matures the, uh, the value of uh, surrender would increase but uh, large surrenders happen between the first and the seventh year and in this particular period the surrender value which has been assigned by the regulator is largely same as it exists today. Uh, now 30% is the surrender value in the second year as proposed 
closed by the regulator, 35 percent in the third year, 50 percent between the fourth and the seventh year, 90 percent in the last two years. Now, just to give you uh, uh, the uh, comparison between the numbers in terms of what was proposed in December 2023 and what has come about now, in the second year, what was proposed was a surrender value of 83,750 on a 1 lakh premium annually. What has come about is just 30,000. In the third year, that surrender value proposed was 1.67 lakh. What has come about is just 70,000. In the fourth year, 2.51 lakh. What has come about is just about a lakh and a half. Fifth year, 3.35 lakh was proposed. What has come about is 2 lakhs. So what, means is, what this means is that in the first seven years, the surrender value remains the same as it exists today. And large part of policies get surrendered between the first and the seventh year, which means no significant impact on life insurance companies with respect to negative margins on anything on those negative lines. Absolutely, Ayash. Thank you very much. But I, I guess as someone who also tracks personal finance, uh, for me, the question really is that who's happier today, insurance companies or those who are insured? Maybe the regulators really try to strike a balance, which is what it's all about. Thank you very much for uh, you know giving us the detailed contours of the final surrender value norms that have come through. To talk about this and get some more perspective, we have Tarun Chog, MD and CEO of Bajaj Alliance Life Insurance, joining in. We also have Gurmeet Chadha, Managing Partner and CIO at Complete Circle uh, with us. Thank you, gentlemen, so much for being with us. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Chuk, let me open with you, and that's really the thought, right? First, uh, the market also took this very negatively, thinking that surrender values will be increased by by a, a you know big notch. But clearly, that's not what the regulator has gone with. It's probably you know listened to the concerns coming in from the industry. Uh, tell us the business impact, because the calculations show that for the first three years, the, the three years is absolutely no change at all, and a small increase in the value that you have to pay to the uh, to the you know policy holders. Uh, after three years, four to seven years. Uh, so to what extent uh, does it impact uh, companies in general and maybe you in particular? Yeah, so uh, I think it's a good balanced approach as you mentioned. Uh, the good thing is that uh, both the customers and the uh, companies have been taken care of in this. So the impact on company valuation should not be much. There will be a slight come down because a certain category of products will be slightly impacted. Uh, but having said that, uh, see, what we have to understand is if you go to the background of all of this, life insurance is largely a long-term uh, product. So the moment you try to do too much of surrender initially, when we did our math, first time I think this math was done for the sector, when we went to the uh, IRDA, they also realized and we were able to put it forward that uh, the biggest loser actually would have been the customer because the IRRs would come out. Usually, typically, in these products, we invest up to 20-25% in equity plans, and that gives us the upside for customers. Uh, and now, given the fact, the uncertainty on surrenders, which could, you know, the surrenders could happen next year itself or almost the same year. So as a result, we would have to invest in cash, overnight cash, where the IRR, hence you can make out, would be significantly different. So I think the balance approach came out well. The IRDA has nudged the sector to come up with a separate stream of products which have higher surrender values. And uh, a little bit has been adjusted to increase surrender values in the existing products. So overall, for the sector, it's fine. And I think the growth uh, of the sector would have been impacted significantly as well. That would be also maintained. You know, do, do you have a, a you know a rough number perhaps uh, for the the sector as a whole? You know, which is the year in which maximum number of policies actually you know uh, get sort of truncated prematurely? Uh, do people usually do that in year two, year three, or is it seen higher in in the later years? Because now the regulation is very clear that if you stay with your policy, uh, the longer you stay, uh, the higher the surrender value in case you need to terminate it prematurely. So what's the current? Uh, break up a rough percentage if you have that in terms of uh, the year in which we're seeing maximum surrendering? So usually it is a sixth year. It's a sixth year when dropouts happen. And I think what has to be understood, these things never get discussed and good you are asking us these questions. If I look at my own company, the average uh, premium paying term of policies is around seven to eight years. So after sixth year, anyways, the uh, surrender values, as you heard from Yash also, get a lot better uh, the moment you in the last couple of years. So that uh, actually has very little impact on uh, insurance uh, customers. All right. Which is uh, good. 
Got it. Hi, Mr. Chug. Good morning and good to see you in. And good me. Thanks a lot for joining in as well. Mr. Chug, I wanted to ask you, you know, brokerages earlier, they were estimating anything between 400 to 500 basis point hit on the VNB margins for life insurers. That's if the earlier proposed surrender value had come into existence. Now, with these new regulations, that hit is entirely out or could some hits still come about? Yeah, uh, the calculations were near apt. I think uh, would have been even more, in fact, if you ask me. But uh, with this change now, uh, there is very little uh, impact and far, far lesser, if I might say. We are still doing the math. We are waiting the final master circular. Uh, see, some product streams would be impacted. For example, in non-power plans now, they will have to be an asset share as well, which was earlier that concept of a new uh, of an asset share has come. It's a new concept uh, that will impact a certain stream of uh, non-power plans, but largely uh, very little impact. Now, you can always change the mix, right, over a period of time. Okay, got it. All right, uh, Mr. Chug, we got that. Let's get in Gurmeet as well into the conversation. Hi, Gurmeet. Good morning, and uh, good to see you. In well, Gurmeet, tell us. Uh, what do you all like from the insurance pack? Uh, you know, which are the uh, top stocks that you like? And if you could give us some rational as well out there. Sure. Uh, so I think I guess this, uh, the word threshold premium getting removed from the final draft uh, is a bit of a relief to uh, insurers with high non-par uh, share as, as Mr. Chug also mentioned, because the threshold premium essentially said that above a certain threshold of premium, uh, you know, the surrender charges can only be applied to a third certain threshold and above that the premium has to be returned, which as you rightly said, could have impacted VNB by maybe 200 to 500 basis points. So that's why you see the, the guys with higher non-par, which is Max and HDFC Live, obviously showing more respite, at least in today's trade. Uh, I think Max has been doing very well if you see nine months of uh, in terms of gross return premium, in terms of AP, I think they've done amongst the best. Uh, also, one of their new product was Step, which is meant for the affluent segment, uh, where you know you uh, pay for just in the terminal illness also, and uh, there's an option of getting the premiums back. That's done very well for them, and they're both banker and proprietary models are doing well. Uh, uh, you know, proprietary model actually grew 45, 46 percent last quarter, and with Axis Bank infusing, uh, you know, almost 1600 crores, I think eventually it will be Axis Light as as things stand right now. Uh, improve the solvency ratio as well. So I think I think that's something we like. Uh, HFC Life uh, for the I think mean, HSB has a little bit of a muted year post the uh, tax uh, you know changes which happened in the budget. Also, Nigel Bank's focus has also slightly changed. Anyone with anyone with higher bankish banker share is also getting impacted because banks are very very geared up on deposit mobilization with the with the scenario you have. So I think we like Max. We also like SBI Life, which is more steady. And maybe maybe as you see life uh, in that pecking order. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chuk, IRDAI has also said that no premium can be changed during the entire policy term of the contract. Earlier, it could be changed after three years. Will that be a bit of a negative or a hit to the industry? Uh, see, let, let me just uh, tell you more about this. In saving plans, usually this is a non-issue. It really is an impact in the critical illness plans and in the health plans. Health plans, anyways, uh, we do not write indemnity plans. We write only uh, benefit plans. So then it will uh, finally, so that's not a big big part of the entire piece. So where it then starts hitting us is really the CI plan, the critical illness plans. Uh, see, the problem there is uh, the reinsurance for these will become a little bit more difficult. We'll have to find it. The market will have to adjust to a different level. Uh, so usually uh, earlier, for every three years, we could have looked at the critical illness uh, payouts and uh, the premiums could be revised accordingly. That is not possible anymore. Uh, so it will impact that. We'll have to see how we can take benefit of that for the customer. Good thing is we can now do short-term health plans as well and short-term critical illness plans as well. So that I think will make up for this, and uh, uh, we'll have to see whether long-term critical illness plans can be even manufactured now. Mm. Uh, Mr. Chuk, you know, just to go back to that earlier point, and also to uh, you know get a sense of the product modifications that you're speaking of, you said that uh, the maximum drop-off happens in the sixth year. I guess that's also because of the way products have been designed, right? Because you're locked in for five years, you have to keep paying premium. And at earlier, it was also sort of, uh, you know, these were policies where the, the policy was being taken more from, a, you know, perhaps an investment perspective 
than pure insurance. And again, on that anyway, there's, there's, there's now a tax clamp down of uh, 5 lakhs. So uh, going forward, what are the, uh, the product modifications that perhaps insurers will make? And will customers also have to be sort of educated that if, you, if you're a customer who perhaps wants to have flexibility of uh, tendering in your insurance policy, uh, you know, before its term ends, uh, then be be ready to have uh, you know a lower return product. Is that how things is that how things will evolve? See, I think uh, it, it is uh, very difficult to predict. It's it's never never easy to talk about uh, what's going to happen. Let's say a couple of years hence or next year, very clearly with the change of product guidelines. Uh, but what I can say is that uh, a five year term usually is a is a pretty long term term from an Indian mindset. Uh, uh, if you were talking of Japan and other countries, they would usually sell 10-year, 12-year, 15-year products, and they'll be having very high persistency all throughout. Uh, in India, five, given the way we work, given the way we think, we, we keep a lot of options open in, our, in, in front of our financial services uh, plans that we've got. Uh, five years is, is, is long enough, and it's really the six-year dropout, hence, will impact lesser. And as also I clarified that usually the seventh, eighth, year is, is where most policies tend to get drawn out. What will happen is customers, uh, with this regulator, regulation particularly, is that customers will have to uh, be given more disclosures, which we're very happy with anyways. Uh, it will break down a lot of the mis-selling when it comes to long-term product selling. Uh, these disclosures, as you see in the regulations coming in, uh, will result in people being more mindful of what they're getting. Uh, that itself will kind of bifurcate the market into two parts. One, somebody who's in, investing for the longer term, and one who's looking at uh, maybe anytime surrender kind of product. So those kind of surrender products will also start coming. Uh, initially, you're right. Those new category of products will not have a very high IRR that uh, you know we can currently give when uh, we have longer term products. Uh, because the, like I mentioned, the LM has to be matched. You would not be investing in equities in that. You'd have more cash, overnight cash in it. Uh, that itself uh, will have to be seen. I have a feeling over a couple of years, that will stabilize, and the IRs on those products also will come in. Currently, people will test waters with that. Okay. All right. We're in for interesting times, for sure. Uh, that is from the policy buyer's perspective. But Gurmeet, uh, last word with you from the investor's perspective. Which life insurance stock would you want to buy now? Now that at least this one overhang is out of the way. Uh, so as I said, uh, Sulbi, we have uh, Max, uh, SBI, and SDFC. In fact, right, Bajaj Finserv, which is not really a pure insurance play. It's a, it's a play on other sectors. Also gives a lot of valuation comfort. You know, if you see the uh, uh, the growth in EPS for last two years and price performance, I think it it's 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 been quite subdued. Uh, also, I think there's something which I was, I'm talking other than this news is this Bima Isugam, which is a marketplace for insurers. I think that will eventually lead to more transparency, more interest being catered for everybody in the value chain of insurance, including investors, intermediaries, and and providers, and its impact on policy bazaar. I think that's something which, which the marketplace is something which is I want to see more in, other than the draft guidelines, uh, because a, a PB fintech has turned pro profitable. You know, if you see even nine months now, they are profitable, and it's a very asset light model. And their credit business also now is picking up pace. So if you see their trail, which is what you make on mortgage on an ongoing basis now, contributes 15% to the overall credit revenue. So the trail is also picking up, which makes the you know the annuity annuity flows more stable. Uh, so that's something I'm tracking more other than other than this. You know, Gurmeet, great you brought that up. Actually, PV FinTech is uh, doing very well right now, almost 4% higher. And I want to get uh, Mr. Chuk's comment on on Bima Sugam as well. But just to complete the point, Gur uh, Gurmeet. Uh, so, doesn't a new platform like this, where all insurers have to come through, and it's been you know put together by the regulator itself, doesn't it offer some sort of uh, you know higher competition to a platform like PB FinTech? Right now, the stock is showing no concern at all on margins, on commissions. But just your views on this? So, uh, you know, I think you have to see. It's like ONDC versus Zomato and Swiggy, right? The platforms are always there. Just that the market is huge, and insurance is a technical product. Half of the terminology people don't understand. And PB Fintech has been working on even non-assisted sales. So one is the assisted sales you do, which is more digital. And then is a non-assisted sales. So insurance, in my view, is still a complex product. So I think it will take time. And that's why I said I want to look at this space more closely and see what the impact would be. So anybody who's asset light, 
uh, you know, who's been there for a time would obviously have a first mover advantage. And any marketplace eventually leads to more efficiency in the market. That's my, that's my personal view. Yeah, no fair point and that's a very valid point that uh, maybe it's still not that easy for people to go and buy policies on their own or DIY as they can do with mutual funds. Maybe that's, that's a far more simpler product than insurance. Mr. Chog, your, uh, your view on Bhima Sugam and how that changes things with the industry and just purely in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the channels through which you will be now selling, uh, what changes with Bhima Sugam also coming in in terms of insurance and just the whole distribution framework now? I think Bhima Sugam is a significant step forward. Um, an idea, I think, is really being very pragmatic at looking at the way customers would want to buy things in the future. Uh, a significant segment of the customers will find servicing, claim handling, uh, the process uh, of Bhima Sugam uh, to be very smooth and uh, far smoother than what they currently see. More so, it will bring in a lot of transparency uh, in the sector, and transparency is equal to trust. Uh, so the more the trust in the sector, it will only just uh, have a multiplier effect on the market growing. And, and that's what is really uh, my focus. That's what I think will make a big difference, because today people and they lock in their money for seven, 10 years aren't really sure. So the moment they see it available on a large platform, it is everybody together, they can see it for themselves, uh, it will increase the uh, throughput of insurance. I think that's really where I focus on. In terms of uh, distribution, it's it's all distributors will be present on this as well. So the process for them also becomes easier. Uh, so I think there are no losers, they're only winners in this. Okay, gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for joining in. It's been an enlightening discussion. Thank you for your thoughts. We'll get into a break. On the other side, we'll get you an exclusive market conversation with Ramdev Agrawal, joint MD of Motilal Oswal Financial Services. Welcome back. Well, the markets are still trading with a cut of close around 50 to around 60 points, but volumes still on the lower side. Well, let's get you some exclusive market conversations now. My colleague Surbi caught up with Ramdi Agarwal, joint MD of Motilal Oswal Financial Services, to talk about the market trajectory, how one should look at market corrections, and much more. Let's listen into excerpts of that conversation. See, there will be, there is a thing called unloam willom in yoga, isn't it? You keep breathing and then you have to breathe, breathe out, out also. also yeah. It is necessary. Yeah. If you don't breathe out, can you can you keep breathing up? <laughs> no. You cannot market are like that. Yeah. Yeah. Every stock, every sector has to breathe up. And then after a big rally, yeah. you have to have a good correction. Sure. Sometimes corrections are immediately after small rally. Sure. Sometimes it's after big rally. <laughs> you know, so but correction is extremely necessary, essential part of the stock market movement. True. You have to take it for granted. And if you and that is why it, it is called risk asset. It can be up, it can be down. Sure. And that is what is not being liked by the investors at large. You have to understand it is integral. This is quotational losses. The corrections are quotational losses. They're not losses. Mm -hmm. They are quotational losses. You have been overpaid. 100 went to 200. You have been overpaid. Don't take it, you are paid. You are still in the stock. Mm -hmm. You should have got only 160. <laughs> so 200 has to come to 160. But it will not come to 160. It will come to 140. Mm -hmm. Because market has market doesn't have a very precise way of uh, giving a price. Mm -hmm. It is very approximate machine. Mm -hmm. You know, it will go five steps up, four steps back, then again seven steps up, then four steps down, like that. So, you know, uh, recently, in the recent past, words like froth, etc. Mm -hmm. were being used yeah, for yeah, yeah, the sure. broader market, mid and small yeah, cap. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you believe that there's Yeah, of course it was there. And do you believe more correction yeah, has to see, happen? Yeah, see, what is happening is, you must understand the factors driving the market right mm -hmm. now. Factors are the number of investors which are coming in. After 75 years, first time we are seeing celebration of retail investing yes. or celebration of the stock market. Okay, thanks to digital infrastructure, thanks to KYC norms uh, being uh, eased out, and uh, uh, generally the mandate by government that capital formation uh, in the country is extremely important for the sustained growth in the future. Mm. Okay, now that equity, see, for a country to grow or enterprises to grow, job market to grow, you need enterprises to grow. Enterprises will grow only if you provide them adequate quantity of equity capital to start with at reasonable prices. And then debt capital is there. If Once you have the equity, then you have the debt. 
but without equity there is no debt so the, the show doesn't happen so clearly this is happening we are getting about 4 to 5 million customers every month hmm. and this is a record hmm. from 35 40 million in 2020 we have reached last month 150 million i think we are headed straight to 300 million 300 million and then well, it's a revolution yeah. and it is not going to happen overnight hmm. it is going to take 3 to 4 years sure. and then after that after 300 million let's let's first reach 300 million hmm. then we'll talk about 600 million hmm. okay now what is happening is the pace is accelerating Instead of going down after four, five, th four, and then three and a half and three, mm. it is actually going from three to four to five. And now, let's see, we have done 4.65 max. Mm. I don't know what is the number for March. Mm. But my sense is now, initially, there were only 30, 40 million customers satisfied. So they were bringing their brothers and sisters and all. Yeah. Yeah. Now, 150 million are satisfied. Mm. So the whole society after society mm. is coming in. Like the whole city is coming. Whole township is coming. Sure. Whole building is coming. Sure. So now there is a lot more movement mm. and acceptability mm. of the concept of investing some portion of your savings. See, last year, yeah. between in 23, 24, as of this Friday, the number came. We have collected about 17 lakh crores of fixed deposits. Mm. Bank deposits have grown by, I think, uh, 13 percent mm. uh, and 103. So I think mm. 17, 18 lakh crores have come. Mm. I think stock market must have got during the same period about three to four lakh crores, yeah. uh, maybe five lakh crores. Mm. So only, I mean, only one fourth yeah. or one third of the fixed deposit. Yeah. That is not the right thing. Eventually, it will become almost equal. Sure. But yeah. that may take five, seven years. So Fair. it is a we are into midst of very huge market. Uh, sorry, uh, what I would say, uh, savings mm. allocation change in the mm. economy, mm. and this will happen. It will take time, and mm. economy has to also perform. Yeah. See, just by bringing money. The show is not going to happen. Exactly. People it, are coming because at the end of the yeah. day, they have seen what has happened from March 2020. And a lot of the retail investors, there are a lot of new time people yeah. who've come to, new new age investors who've yeah. come to the market, right? Yeah. They've not seen cycles. They've not seen a meaningful correction. Does that bother you at all? No, it doesn't bother me because the color money is same. Mm -hmm. Whether you put it as a professional or some new guy puts it. Mm -hmm. The issue is that overall aggregate money, mm -hmm. where it is going? Is it going into the... Uh, uh, building up of the infrastructure. Is it going to build a uh, corpus? I mean, is it a primary issuance or is it a secondary? Like ITC bat taking away, say, uh, $3 billion or $2.5 billion. Yeah. That doesn't help that much. Hmm. Or Indigo promoter taking away a billion dollars. That doesn't help. Hmm. Hmm. Of course, it is necessary part of the capital market. But disproportionate amount should go into the primary issuance. Hmm. So like uh, 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 a telecom company issuing, say, 50,000 crores worth of bonds or equity hmm. and that being subscribed. What they will do, they will go and put up uh, new towers, new, sure. you know, sure. so sure. that will actually spur the economy. You know, it's it's really uh, interesting that you brought up some of these huge block deals that have happened yeah. and a lot of them have happened. I think 2023, yeah. we saw massive blocks coming in. It's continuing in 24. Yeah. And this is also a question that comes up uh, because at the end of the day, because of the, the retail revolution, uh, a lot of the buyers are mutual funds. So, I mean, I am buying at the end of the day when maybe a promoter is selling or maybe yeah, a very that's sophisticated fine. That's team. Fine. They also have a right to sell. They have a right to sell, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But is there any reason to worry because they are supposedly smart there insiders? There is nothing to worry. There is a natural selling. market phenomenon. Okay. So, you must understand mm -hmm. if you raise the prices, supply will come. Mm -hmm. Asman says supply. Hai. <laughs> Whether FIs sell, promoters yeah. sell, block deal happens, new issuance come, supply will come. So, first three years, we saw the boom in the demand side mm. because of this inflow. Mm. Now you'll see the, the uh, what do you call, the, the power of supply. But that does that mean that it, so, maybe for an entry, no, there's it, a bit it, of a top no, in no, the market? No. Are, yeah, don't become too topish, this, that. Achha. It's a part of the game. Mm. See, it, it, see if, you, if you're playing football, mm. I mean, if one guy is Man Manchester United, other side is uh, Motila Oswal team, <laughs> what will happen? They'll just go and keep hitting. Why? There has to be supply. Mm. Supply will come and that is the healthiest part. Okay. That is the real role of the stock market. Okay, so Mr. Ramdev Agrawal not at all worried about the rise in promoter selling, all the block trades. He's saying it's a deeper market. It's a healthy market. The correction has made it even healthier. And for medium to long term investors, there's absolutely no reason to worry. We'll play out more excerpts from that interview. Uh, Nigel, he's expecting the Nifty to double in the next five years. So there's a man who's saying invest for the future. Indeed. Uh, all right. Interesting uh, conversation. We keep getting you, uh, you know, various parts of that conversation all through the day. But let's go to our special segment now, Charting Trends. 
Mitesh Nakar joins us to help us out with a few ideas. Uh, hi, Mitesh. Uh, welcome back on the show. Well, let's talk about a couple of ideas that you have. Pidilite, that's the stock that you're looking at and it's looking particularly good on the charts. Tell us more. Nigel, I think, you know, uh, very importantly, what Pidilite was doing since uh, uh, about June, uh, May, June of 22, was getting into a contracting pattern on the monthly basis, which means that the longer term charts were contracting. Actually, I saw that for the last about 18 months, the stock didn't give any kind of absolute returns. The indicators were coming, uh, uh, were, you know, coming out from the overbought levels and uh, settling down on the monthly basis. So we saw the stock, you know, just being sideways broadly, not getting past 2800 and not falling much below 23, 2400 on the downside. That contraction has now come to an end and there's some kind of a breakout which has taken place. Recommend buying this one for targets of 3400, 3600, I think, you know, it uh, looks very logical extension and even possibility of 3900 exists on the chart. So these are the upside, you know, uh, this is the kind of upside which this stock price can give in the next uh, four to six to seven months. And unless something the stock starts breaking below 2740, the long-term trend and the bias will be on the upside. So that's a very strong buy for me for the aforementioned price targets. And the target price over the next few months is 3,900, right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, over the next five to seven months. Uh, let's move on to the other one, Gujarat Gas. Uh, what's the chart telling you? You know, this is a stock, you know, which had a very strong month uh, uh, in, the, uh, on, in, in January 2024. And then what we have seen is that uh, for the entire month of February and March, the stock is giving a pullback. Now, given the fact that this is a pullback happening on the longer term charts, it gives you a very enticing entry point in terms of risk reward equation. So accumulate the stock between 530, 500 range and keep a stock below 455. So you have about 10% kind of a risk. And the long term chart suggests targets of around 620, possibly 670 in the next four to six months. So giving you a good risk reward equation from the current levels. and. Since the long-term trend is on the upside, very clearly a buy for me. All right. Uh, Mitesh, I particularly want to know what you're going to say on HUL. You know, that stock goes into its shell for a while, for a few years sometimes, and then it comes up and then it moves. You know, as we saw, I think between 2000 to 2010, didn't move at all. 2000 to 2020, went like a rocket. And last few years, big underperformer. What's the view right now? In fact, I think, you know, in the near term, which is uh, a few months for the stock price on the long-term charts, uh, Nigel, if you observe the movement starting from uh, September of 21, I think on about eight or nine occasions, the stock has touched levels of 2670 on an intra-month basis, never giving a monthly closing above that. So it's, you know, some kind of a top formation which has happened over here. And now there is a breakdown below the monthly average. So my sense is that the stock is an underperformer. Avoid if somebody has it, it's an exit. I'm looking at sub 2000 levels as the minimum. We could see, you know, in, in, in panic, I think even uh, levels of around... Uh, 1940 to about 1875 but i think this is not a stock which will participate in the upside so if you have your money blocking over there exit and i think you know try to look for better opportunities and finally srf uh even with a disclaimer here that i've just bought uh, srf into my portfolio as well i think again this is a stock you know which was consolidating uh in the range of about 2200 to about 2600 that consolidation has already lasted 24 months and now there are early signs of a breakout. So, you know, I have bought some quantity. I would want to see the stock price get beyond this 26, 25, 26, 30 levels to add more. But I think once that happens, keep a stop at 2480 and the measuring implications of this breakout suggest that on the longer term charts, we could see the stock head towards 30 to 50 as a minimum with 34, 50, 3500 as the logical targets. Okay, gentlemen, uh, Mitesh, thank you very much uh, for joining in. Those are some medium term, uh, you know, stock opinions. Pity Light, HUL, Gujarat Gas, and the last one is SRF, uh, you know, which Mitesh likes over the medium term, over the next couple of months. The Nifty is still down close to about 70, 80 points, 76 points lower. The Sensex is down close to about 300 points. Mid caps, though, are holding up. Uh, on the way down, Reliance Industries is down close to about 1%. So that's hurting on the sidelines. That's a heavyweight which is weak in trade. Power Grid is the top nifty loser. A couple of pharma names like Devise Laboratory, Dr. Reddy, Sipla are weak in trade. In fact, even the Nifty Pharma Index is one of the big drags today. Tata Consumer, Maruti. Maruti is under pressure because uh, remember the company has recalled 16,000 units of Wagner, you know, um, I think and Beleno also. Uh, so that recall is a bit of a sentiment 
negative for Maruti Suzuki. We'll slip into a break. On the other side, Manisha will join in with the latest from the commodity space. Welcome back. As promised, let's talk commodities. Manisha is with us. Manisha. Well, thank you so much for that. I'm looking at metals as a sector because there's some cooling off here after that recent run-up that we saw in prices. Well, the dollar is strengthened a bit. That's weighing on. And in the recent days, while, of course, we've seen recovering data from China, the expectation that the U.S. Fed rate cut will happen in the month of June, there is a 75% probability of that. And the markets also have seen better Chinese data coming in. But from those kind of levels, now there is some profit-taking. We're ending, uh, we're closing towards March ending as well. And this could be one of the reasons that this is happening. I want to start with copper first. And that one, uh, is off the one-year highs that we saw it trading within. We saw 9100 It's trading at $8,700 a ton now. The prices have had run up because uh, China smelters cut production, halted production for various areas there. And also when you look at the deliverable copper on exchanges, that is gained about 20% on a week-on-week -week basis. But after that hype and all-time highs in China, there is profit-taking by speculators, hedge funds as well that you have seen come in case of copper. Zinc as well has seen a very sharp decline in the matter of last two or three trading sessions. That is after Glencore uh, announced that Nordenham smelter will resume after one year. Also, when you look at the zinc inventories on LME, they are at a multi-year highs, almost standing at around 275,000 tons there. Not just copper and zinc, nickel is off its one-month uh, highs as well. We are trading at one-month lows, actually, when it comes to this one. This is after Indonesia has announced that the production quota of 152,000 million tons is what they have approved and is in process of approving by the time March ends. So you have more uh, nickel coming out of Indonesia and a similar story coming in for tin as well, which is off its eight-month highs. One, the inventories have been increasing. And and two, you have Indonesia issuing new production quota of 400,000 tons for this year. So all the metals after that recent run-up have come under some profit-taking. When you look at the prices on a week-on-week -week basis, we are actually trading into negative for many of those there. For this week now, it's going to be about the China manufacturing and services PMI numbers. And it also is going to be about the Fed speeches and inflation data. All of that comes in in this week now. I want to take you through on what the metals have done for the month of March until now, and that's a story to tell, because when you look at the non-ferrous space, we are in the positive here. Copper is up 4.5%, and the best of the gains clearly coming in for aluminum there. Steel and iron ore prices are up on a week-on-week -week basis, but on a month-on-month -month basis, we still are into negative here, but clearly that has improved also. But the best gains clearly are in for the precious metal prices, where you have gold up 7.5%, and silver is an outperformer with 10% gains for the month of March. Okay, all right. Thanks a lot for that, Manisha. Well, let's focus on a couple of stocks that are moving around. IMFA, that's Indian Metals. Uh Ferro Alloy as well. That stock is buzzing in today's trading session. It's up closer on 6% and moving on massive volumes. Let's tell you why. In the next couple of days, that's on March 29th, they're going to be considering a special dividend for FY24. The street is quite excited about that. Why could they be considering this uh, special dividend? Because they've received around 130 crores with regard to compensation for the Utkal Sea coal block. And they have another 200 to 250 crores that's due. So the, the entire sum was around 350 to 380 crores odd. They're expecting to get that for the time being. They've got around 130 crores, so they want to reward their shareholders. And point number three is the margin outlook could be better because I'm looking at global uh, pricing for ferrochrome. Well, it's been benchmarked higher, which means that visibility for quarter one FY25 margins are good. And also you have coking coal costs that have come down. For IMFA, their biggest strength is they're getting ferrochrome ore, chrome ore from their own backyard. And because they're getting the key raw material from their own backyard, while the globe is in scarcity, well, that's what's helping them. So they're going to get the benefit of higher selling price of ferrochrome, and they are also going to get the chrome ore prices, which will not move from their own backyard. Put all that together, the stock is moving, and it's moving higher on much higher volumes than we normally see. So that's about Indian metals and ferro alloys. But let's talk about Avenue Supermarts as well. Manglam joins us to uh, tell us more about that. Manglam. Well, there was an upgrade coming in this morning from ICICI Securities. They've upgraded the stock from hold to add with the target price increase from 4,100 to 4,800 as well. And they've compared it to the likes of Nestle, where they say that they expect demand to actually go ahead and outperform Nestle in the medium term. Why is that? Well, because over the last two years or so, you know, uh, demand's premium over Nestle has reduced from erstwhile 50% to about 8% when it comes to valuations. And uh, the problems that uh, demand has are largely in the price and known. So there is limited downside risk as well. And even if you compare the revenue CAGR that DMART has posted 
which is lower than the pre-COVID levels of 25 to 30 percent to around 18 to 21 percent with 6 to 10 percent same store sales growth. It is much higher than the other comparable FMCG peers and as a result of which uh, they believe that it is a stock poised to outperform from here, especially given its healthy net profit margin. What about Nestle uh, that they do not like in the very near future? They say that the positives have played out for Nestle and they expect time correction in the stock price. And the revenue growth outperformance that Nestle had versus peers over the last 8-10 quarters is also likely to moderate because now price hikes are in the base as well. So if they had to make a portfolio choice, they would choose Avenue Supermarts over Nestle and that explains the up move that we're seeing on DMART right now. Okay, thank you very much for that. We'll get into a break. On the other side, we'll put the spotlight on RBI's actions on the financiers with the recent one coming in on IFL Finance and JM Financial as RBI plans to conduct special audits. They've invited the floated e-tenders for the same. We'll be joined by Abhizar Divanji of EY India and Sanjay Doshi of KPMG India on the other side. Welcome back. Well, let's put the focus now on uh, the recent RBI actions on uh, financiers with the, the latest coming in uh, uh, on both IIFL Finance as well as well as JM Financial Products. Now, the RBI has uh, asked for special audits to be conducted on these two entities. And remember, this flows from the earlier move when uh, the Reserve Bank of India had stopped IIFL Finance from uh, taking uh, you know any further uh, sort of steps in its gold loan business basically that was shut down with the immediate effect and ditto for uh, JM Financial Products loan against share business. We've got the two experts uh, of the BFSI space to give us some more perspective on this uh, heightened scrutiny that we're seeing from the regulator. Sanjay Doshi, Partner Financial Services Advisory Leader at KPMG India is joining in. Uh, and uh, we'll also have another guest in just a bit on this. Sanjay, thanks so much for uh, being with us uh, you know, on this discussion. What do you make of things? Because you know, in the recent times, we've seen the RBI get extremely active with respect to individual corporates, individual BFSI you know, players. It started with Paytm, then IFL Finance, JM Financial Products. And now what we're hearing is that there will be a special audit in some of these cases. How would you read the news of this uh, special audit? So, see, uh, effectively, RBI definitely is uh, very worried and taking proactive steps, uh, especially in some of the lending areas, uh, lending where there are a lot of retail loans. Personal loans is uh, one of the big areas, and you have seen actions or regulations really coming up in those areas. And also areas where they feel that there can be potential evergreening or the collaterals and the process around verifying the collaterals or the KYC is not done properly. And especially in gold loans, you know, how the quality of uh, the gold has been measured by NBFCs or banks and also the way the auction processes gets conducted. So it's more effectively really getting ensured that uh, the processes are there in place, uh, steps taken proactively, so no systemic risk really comes uh, in the future. Mm. So got that. They're looking to check for evergreening if there is any systemic risk. Is this going to be a forensic audit, Sanjay? I would call it a special audit yet. Uh, in terms of forensic means, okay, fine, there is an objective where you can see frauds really happening. So whether it, okay. you can call it a forensic investigation, uh, too early, it's more of a special audit where RBI is taking an independent audit uh, to okay. really understand the processes be, uh, behind it. And how long would an exercise of this nature take to complete? Well, it really depends upon how deep they really want to go to. It can take anything around four to eight weeks. Uh, depending upon how deep they really want to go to and the, 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 the kind of period, the scope really they want to cover. Hmm. So, uh, Sanjay, what uh, in the past, what do we know and what can be the typical outcome? Could it just be, uh, you know, more from an observation standpoint or could, uh, you know, special audits like these lead to, uh, you know, fresh curbs, more regulation? Uh, you know, what does history tell us? Well, uh, you will see this kind of audits definitely it's something of the recent uh, where RBI really is going, as I said, proactive. So yeah, one of the options or one of the outcomes can actually be uh, changing in processes or uh, more uh, tightening of processes coming in. I think RBI has really laid down guidelines. One is to really ensure that, uh, uh, you know, that particular audit which is happening on any company, that company is really following that process, uh, the guidelines, etc. But in top, if they really find lacunas really happening where it's a market practice and that market practice needs to be curtailed, then definitely we'll see more regulations coming in. Mm. 
you said that you know while it's difficult to ascertain the total time duration of this exercise, but it ta may take four or eight weeks. So it's safe to assume that at least for two months now, both IFL Finance and JM Financial may not be able to resume the practices which RBI has clamped down on, right? Well, that's something I don't know. I can't comment on uh, what's really going to happen and what will be the action there from the company's perspective. Okay. Uh, you said, uh, you know, the possibility that this may be a market practice also, right? The RBI wants to assess if this is a very company-specific issue or is this a you know, market-wide practice that they want to bring under control. Have you done any early analysis on this particular point? Uh, I don't personally have visibility whether they have done early analysis. Of course, there have been actions in the past. They get data. RBI today has gets a lot of data, right? Uh, they get access to the portfolio data. The access to in terms of the audit reports which uh, the companies have, the internal audit reports, etc. So there can be some signs, but see, effectively, uh, think about gold loans, right? Gold loans, where the purity of gold is definitely very important, and whether you really are seeing the practices around auctions, are the auctions really happening at a very low value? Are the auction processes really conducted where the borrowers at the end of the day is a defaulter, right? But there should not be any kind of unfair practices really happening there. So gold loan is definitely is one area where RBI just wants to ensure that things are clean. The borrowers also get a fair, uh, you know, hearing on what's really happening on those collateral and on the auction. And at the same time, there should not be any over leverage or evergreening or lending against collateral. So for example, is the purity at 18 carat, uh, but uh, is it considered at 24 carat? And hence, you really are actually giving it a very high loan to value. So some of those practices will definitely be under the radar. Mm, okay. So, uh, you know, that's on the gold loan side. Uh, the other issue which pertains to, of course, the other entity, which is GM Financial Products, I mean, uh, that do you think is more a, a, more a company-specific issue perhaps or when it comes to this model as well, uh, you know, loan against shares, whether this also calls for wider scrutiny looking at overall industry practices? So it's also happened in the past, right? Once you actually yeah. see post or during the Lehman crisis also, you had actually see a lot of leverage finance happening on IPOs, happening on even buying shares, etc. And at that point in time also, a lot of companies and a lot of NBFCs had taken losses. So today, uh, whether it's a market practice, whether it's a per se company issue, definitely IPOs are on the upswing. Uh, a lot of financing happening behind the IPOs or for the IPOs. So is there any kind of uh, wrong practices really happening there? This will be definitely a case where we'll figure out uh, based on the audit. Can't say whether it's per se a company or per se a market. Sure, yeah, I think uh, absolutely we do have to wait for the outcome and see what more the Reserve Bank has to say. Abzir Jivanji, partner and national leader of financial services, uh, financial services at EY is also joining into the conversation. Abzir, uh, great to have you on. So, you know, we've been asking Sanjay whether... Uh, you know, the street or investors or stakeholders need to be a little more concerned now that there is a special audit that the RBI has called yes. for on these two entities. How should we interpret this new development? So again, I think it's the next logical step because RBI has uh, actually asked them to stop the operations. Uh, and the next logical step would be to get in and, uh, and appoint an external person to do an audit. Uh, what is to be interpreted out of this is I think, uh, I think RBI is extend increasingly getting more and more exemplary. So I think it's about the product uh, and the process and less about those companies. Uh, because uh, I think these practices may be followed across and that's why these companies would also be following them. But the idea is that when, when there is an audit done on some of these companies, then others uh, tend to get more uh, you know cautious about what they need to do. Everyone in fact is introspecting. Whenever I speak to other NBFCs, they're actually looking into their portfolios and figuring out uh, what they could do better and what is not in the spirit of what RBI wants them to do. So I think RBI is coming down, but as I've always said, you know, in, in, in one of your earlier talks too, that the larger issue is the way credit is flowing and where we are not really sure of the end use of credit. So you do gold loans, one doesn't know where the money is going. You do, uh, you know, capital market loans, you don't know where the money is going. At the end of it, if it's a machinery loan, then one knows that one's buying a machinery or a productive asset, or even sometimes consumer assets. But when you do PLs or when you do uh, you know, secure lending against gold shares, one really doesn't know where the money is going. And I think that is causing a larger systemic risk uh, to the RBI. On, uh, Abhisar, on the capital market standpoint, uh, gold, I'm going, you can still argue there's a collateral. Of course, it's the purity and the value of that collateral that in this one case is what the RBI was trying to sort of uh, you know, check upon. 
But on the capital market side, are you expecting any further regulations, maybe more sort of checks and balances, more curbs, uh, perhaps so in I think the coming days? Just because be of the combination. Hmm. Yeah, there'll be a combination of RBI and SEBI. So RBI's concern is more on systemic risk uh, and less on markets. SEBI would be more concerned on market manipulations. Is money being given to individuals to subscribe for shares, which is then dumped into the market on this team? So those kind of issues and whether whether issues are being artificially made to succeed, those kind of issues is where SEBI will, uh, will have a concern. Uh, so I think it's going to be joint regulatory action uh, to some extent to figure out, uh, you know, uh, where the uh, end use of the money is going and and are investors being duped in the bargain because you know it's unfortunate in our country we either have uh, you know uh, uh, the fixed deposit markets of the banks or we have the equity markets uh, you know to gain money and and, and as investors seek more and more yields uh, given expected inflationary trends uh, you know people are tending more towards the equity markets not really knowing the kind of risk they're taking all right, gentlemen, I think uh, we'll perhaps wait by and the coming days are going to, you know, uh, give us some more hues and clues to figure out what's happening with the uh, lending on the NBFC side. Thank you for joining in uh, to both of you. And with that, uh, we are out of time and at the end of Bazaar, leaving the market uh, with about a 70-point cut on the large cap space. It's the mid-cap and the broader market that's uh, faring a little better, at least at the index level. Thank you very much for uh, being with us, but uh, do stay tuned. All the action continues up next as Chartbusters.